start editing now. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to 60... Oh, Jesus, that's a good start. The Japanese archway. I mean, I guess ageism is just okay now. We literally gave the shirt on your back, and you can't even invite <laughs> to a bird build. I literally said, join in. That was a pity invite. It yeah. was. It wasn't, it wasn't really, I mean, it kind of was. But like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Yeah. Uh, I don't want your charity. Yeah, that's right. I know you're on probation and got to do volunteer hours, but we're not that kind of charity. <laughs> the Japanese archway. Hack that in. This is going to be a long ass recording if you keep this up. <laughs> oh, man. I'm determined to get this done so I can... Yeah, have your own little young group build. No, young kids aren't this bitter. And we love you. We like you a bit. I don't know what you guys are saying. Excuse me? <laughs> I called you a pleb. Right. Jedi. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Shut up, John. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna get that in every episode. I know people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, you are these people. The Japanese archway. I'm gonna start over. It's 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 not. It's not, it helps if I can speak. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 68 of the Plastic Posse podcast. I am once again joined by my amazing co-hosts, John Banani, Grant Mayberry, TJ Haller, Scott Gentry and Doug Smith. How are you all doing today? Doing great. Good deal. Yeah, right. can't complain. Absolutely fantastic. It's great to hear. We have a really fun episode for you today. We have a great interview with Bases by Bill, and we've got a couple of interesting discussion points to go through. But first, I want to know what everyone's been working on at the bench. So we will start with Mr. John Banani. Yeah, so on my bench, I've been working on mainly the AK Interactive FJ. Super nice little kit. For those that are building it, I found that just shaving off the locating uh, tabs on those front fenders helps out a lot. But, you know, otherwise, I really like it. I am almost at the primer stage, hoping to get it into primer today. I have the recoilless rifle version from Africa, so I intend to I intend to do the box art. I really like the yellow, you know, the yellow look, the faded, the, you know, rusted patina. And then with the green recoilless rifle on it, I'll throw some stowage in it as well. And then there's also some African figures online that I've been eyeing. So we'll see how that goes. Other than that, I finished a little Rubicon Models LVT, uh, modulated the heck out of it in blue. So uh, really enjoyed that. And then also I have Andy's Tiger One. I hope to kick into high gear actually today as after we're recording. So I'll get the uh, FJ to primer and then hopefully get get some solid progress on the big tiger, which is a Nats project. So we'll talk about that later. Lovely. Keeping very, very busy. That LVT, absolutely gorgeous. Trigger warning, but my God, it's clear. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayberry, how are you and how has your workbench been? Uh, it's been going really well. Uh, well, sorry. I, uh, too, have just finished my uh, FJ-43. Did my, I did the Israeli one. Built a base for it. I uh, got some sticker or got some uh, mini art signs for it and put it on there. JB, I did find a few little spots there. You need to add a little bit of uh, spacers on the tailgate. There's a couple little spots here and there. Great first kit though. Um, Really enjoyed it. Had fun with it. I actually really want to do a TV version now. Um, We were talking about a little bit last night on. Um, I saw also one that was going to Musumu. That was, uh, there's the, uh, has the TV 10 on top, which was actually kind of cool. Other than that, uh, I'm working on finishing up a couple figures. I want to take the Nationals and like JB said, we'll talk about that later. Wonderful. TJ, how about you? Um, I got a whole bunch of stuff I'm working on. I don't remember I don't remember what we talked about the last time. I don't remember if I had finished my FJ the last time we recorded. I don't think I had, but that's done. It was really cool. I built a little little road base for it. I know that definitely wasn't done the last time we recorded. Yeah, it was it was a good kit. I, I agree with John. There's there's some areas that lack refinement, but um it's buildable by for sure. And it's um it's really kind of got me into this like a non non-traditional for me anyways, like theme. So right after I 
finished that. I built a uh, mini art lands bulldog, which is a tractor from the thirties. I threw that thing together, painted it up. It was, it was really probably some of my like favorite work um, that I've done. It really turned out good. I rusted it out. So I'm in the process of building a little vignette base for it. And while the texture was drying on the vignette base, I started painting my wildcat that Ian and I are building. We're both doing the same markings. Um, he painted his cockpit yesterday too. So I was like, well, I better catch up. So I did. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Was, uh, other than that little 70 second scale yak, that's the first cockpit that I've ever painted, which was pretty fun. And what else? What else? Oh, I painted a dinosaur. That was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been kind of busy, honestly, now that I think about it. <laughs> no, that's great to see. I always love to see productivity. Scott, how about you? What you've been up to? Well, I'm going to be kind of the same as everybody else. Been working on my FJ. I decided to do a uh, hardtop version that was uh, a Lebanese government vehicle. It's kind of cool. It has a four four tone camo. It's similar to like uh, the US BDUs in the 1970s kind of a look. I really like it. It's uh, like a black and a tan and a green and a, a reddish brown. So uh, mine's coming along. It's getting there. Um, just about to start uh, the weathering on it. Doug brought me over a little foam base and some balsa to surround that. So that's pretty cool. Went to my local amps meeting this week, which was a lot of fun. The Great Basin Amps is a good group. Martin Drayton was there. It's good to see him. He said he wasn't going to come. So that was a surprise and just a, a great group. We got a lot of good people in there and uh, everybody's doing some good work. I got a, a Dragon Hago that um, I had started a while back and We've got a Pacific themed uh, group build that we're doing. So I'm going to do that hago for that. And that'll be a four tone with the sun uh, camouflage bands on it as well. So that's that's pretty cool. Been messing around with that as well. But yeah, just mostly the FJ. I'm really pleased with how that's that's turning out. I just I love I love Toyota FJs. This just, you know, if I could own a vehicle, that would be uh, one of the ones on the top of my list. They're just really cool. And I'm really glad AK did that subject. So, yeah, it's uh, really pleased with kind of how that's turning out so far. How about you, Jensen? What have you been working on? Um, well, we'll come to me in a second. I would like to go to Doug. Well, yeah, I'm working on the uh, FJ. Uh, mine is the box art from the one I have. It's the hard top. It's going to be an Iraqi Republican Guard unit from Desert Storm. Um, and it's a two-tone camo. Looks looks pretty nice. About ready to to uh, put it in primer tonight. I think I'll get that far. But uh, it's not a bad kit. There's a few spots where I have struggled with trying to align up the instructions with what it's what the instructions are telling me to do and where, where to put the part. Some of them are kind of hard to understand. But I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, other than that, I've been kind of messing with the little Bandai B-Wing that I started a few months ago, and I've got a TIE Interceptor coming to me today from Scott Hall, and I will definitely be knocking that out because, uh, Mando, you know, if you've watched this season, uh, there's a lot of TIE Interceptors, and so I will have to build one of those very, very shortly. That's me right now. How about yourself? Jensen? Um, yeah, quite, quite a bit. A bit like what TJ said. I can't remember what we talked about in the last episode, but I got the, again, the FJ43 finished. Uh, I've not done a base for it. I'm probably going to by the time Nats comes around um, because I just like doing vignettes anyway. So at some point I'll build one for that build. But yeah, I got that finished. I hand painted the camo. It was, again, uh, a Lebanese version. It's... I really liked it. Nice little kit. Um, really like the scheme I went for. Uh, originally, I was going to do box art, but then JB said he was going to do it. And I've already done something that's kind of rusted out anyway recently. So I wanted to try and do something that's hard edge camo, see what that looks like, try and get it all dusty and uh, dusty and dirty. And I think I did that. I'm kind of really happy with it. Uh, nice little build. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, another couple of projects I've got going on is me, Zach and Jackson are doing an M18 buddy build. These guys haven't heard about this yet. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, we're just building them for Nats. We're going to try and, well, we said we weren't going to super detail them, but, um, you know, we know what Zach's like and we know what Jackson's like. So they're going to be super detailing us. Got all the aftermarket for it, metal barrels, some aftermarket decals and the absolutely fantastic Tankcraft 3D printed tracks. First time putting them together. Um, wow. Like super, super impressed. No cleanup, literally just sat in front of the computer one night on a Zoom with everyone just assembling them and they were done in like less than two hours for both runs and you get plenty of spare parts which is cool and then i've also started for a group build we should all be doing for the secret santa group build uh is the 1918 austin armored car in japanese service built the engine 
that's as far as I've gone with that so far because it's mini art. So it's like an engine alone is like a kit in itself. But yeah, that's that's what I've done. So I've got three kits on the go at the minute. Um, that's a lie. I've got two kits on the go at the minute and a vignette. So yeah, trying to be busy, trying to keep busy anyway. It's jolly good fun. The Triple P is sponsored by Tankcraft, makers of highly realistic aftermarket 3D printed tank tracks in 135th scale. Tankcraft Pro Tracks, as real as it gets. These are not just copies of previously produced model kit parts. These designs are based on real one-to-one scale tank track links that Tankcraft has measured and photographed. These designs are then downsized to 135th scale, printed and test fitted on all the major 135th scale armor kits. Having used these tracks, we can honestly say that these are high quality, super detailed, easy to assemble, with fine layer lines that are practically invisible to the naked eye. Cleanup is minimal and usually not even needed. So go on over to tankcraft.com right now, that's T-A-N-K-R-A-F-T dot com, and get yourself a set of pro tracks. While you're there, check out their other cool scale modeling stuff. Your bench will thank you. As a reminder, Posse fans can take 15% off their first order using the code POSSE15 at checkout. That's P-O-S-S-E-15. Right, so I want to go into our first discussion point, which is funny because um, Scott messaged me uh, just the other day saying, hey, check out this video by Adam Savage, and it's about processing negative emotions when doing like models or projects. And it's weird because just the week prior to Scott messaging me, I watched that video, and it, it was it's really weird uh, how extremely relevant it is to everyone. I don't know if uh, uh, you thought the same, Scott, but it was like, wow, a lot of the things that Adam's saying, someone who's that successful in that area of expertise also shares these same thoughts that we do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Adam's a modeler that a lot of us look up to. I know I certainly do uh, with what he's accomplished and to hear him sort of state things that I think all of us have talked about here, you know, challenges that we have was, was really, it just kind of impressed me a lot. And and uh, for the listeners, we'll go ahead and put a link to that in, in the episode notes so you guys can take a look at that video as well. But uh, yeah, <laughs> Jensen, it's just like you said, it's funny that we had kind of both watched the video at the same time. Yeah, we got everyone else to watch it as well, just in case you hadn't already. Um, I just want to kind of go around the room and see what resonated in that video um, with everyone. One of the, this, I made a few points of things he mentioned in that video, uh, video. And one of the important things that resonated a lot was when he says, paying homage to your future self. So at the end of every night, as much as he doesn't want to, he'll clean his studio and the workbench. So because he knows future him will thank him for it. He'll come in, he'll feel much better wanting to go on with projects. That's something that I do not do. And I know that when I come in here and it's a mess, I don't want to work. And I know for a fact, if I sat down each night and thought just 10 minutes of tidying so that when you come in tomorrow, you'll be so much more proactive and you'll be productive and you'll get stuff done. My word, what a difference I would make. But for some reason, yeah, I choose not to, knowing it will have that negative effect on me. I don't know if you guys are the same though. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I always clean up after a project is done, but um, that's something I should adopt into my workflow. I'm the same way as you, Jensen. If I if I go down to the bench and it's a mess, a lot of times that's all the ex- excuse I need to go do something else. So yeah, that's something I, I need to incorporate in my process. So I, I, I will have to say, Scott, that your definition of a mess is way different than my definition of a mess. Because as I mentioned the other day, when you posted a, a, a picture of, of the current set, state of your build with your FJ, everything's laid out neatly. It's, um, what is that? Oh, Adam Savage does it, does it too, where you arrange things a certain way. OCD. No, no, no. It has a, <laughs> it, it has a name. Is it, it's not, it's not knurling. It's, it's something like that. It's, it's a weird word, but it means to arrange things and, and, a way that makes it flow as you build it. He does it with Legos. If you ever watch Adam build Legos uh, anyways. And I'm like, Scott, we are 100% confirmed <laughs> complete opposites because my desk is, I want to say uh, Mike and Dave have talked about it where you have a huge desk and then you work yourself down into like a eight by eight square. <laughs> like That's my desk. That's literally, I am working on a, sheet of paper so i guess i'm eight and a half by 11 but there's stuff on it so maybe i am eight by eight yeah if i like i like having a clean bench and i know that i should do it but i'm like do i really want to no mainly because it doesn't necessarily impact me because my desk has always looked like an atomic bomb has gone off okay it's not as bad as as mike (laughs) mclaney's new man Mike. you're no new man not that bad but it's pretty bad um and i and i know that but I've just gotten to the point where I'm kind of okay with it. However, um, yeah, I should probably adopt that 
clean up after myself and and make future me's life easier. But sometimes I'm like, F that guy, he'll figure it out. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm the same way. Once you get moving and shaking on a project a weekend, I'm, I'm not cleaning my bench, uh, you know, on a Saturday after I've built all day Saturday and I intend to go back on Sunday. I think, you know, for me, it's once those major stints are done, I'll clean up a little bit. Or when I reach like max disaster, uh, as TJ mentioned, we're not, we're not on nuke man, Mike status, but you know, I, I think I fall in probably the same boat as TJ where I, my bench, if I look across it right now, I have an L-shaped bench and there's probably like a square foot I can actually use right now just from <laughs> tools, paints, literally a sprue sitting right next to my computer. Um, it's it's everywhere. It's, uh, it's no different than entering an art studio, I guess you could say. You go into an art studio and there's, there's crap all over the place. And it's, uh, you know, in some regard, you know, uh, organized chaos. I'm no Ian Malcolm, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of chaos theory and I don't know, I deal with it. It's the way I operate. And I, I think maybe that's the most important thing. I don't want to be too prescriptive because everybody is efficient in their own way. If you can operate in a men- messy bench, who am I to tell you otherwise? I mean, if that's your thing, you should not feel ashamed about it. You know, I have a terrible looking bench sometimes down to that two inch by two inch square, but damn it, I think the project came out pretty good. And, you know, this notion that you have to clean up all the time, yeah, it'll help. Maybe that'll help you, but everybody's different. And, you know, if you go into your space and you feel comfortable in it, I mean, I wish I could show the listeners, like there's boxes and books on the floor in this room. And I have gotten to a point where I'll open up a kit, I'll work a little bit. Instead of putting it back on the shelf, I'll put the cover underneath it. And then I'll just sit it somewhere. And I look up on my bookshelf here. I have two models primed, two finished, and three in progress. No organization whatsoever, but they're there. And at some point I'll grab them. A lot of people don't come in here, but it's it's my space. It makes me feel comfortable. It Dare I say it feels warm. When you enter this room as different to other rooms in my house, I feel like there's a different feeling. Now, you know, someone could walk in and go, oh my God, a bomb went off in here. Um, but someone who's comfortable, this is your happy space. This is the space that you've known, you love. And, you know, my wife could walk in and be like, how do you find anything? And it's, it's a no, you know, I, I feel like we all feel the same way where whether it's a sprue paint box, if you're working on it and you set it aside, you know exactly where you put it and you can come back to it anytime. Uh, and, and I think that's organization in some way too. So I guess long story short is do what makes you productive. If it's not productive, maybe look at an alternative method. Maybe it's cleaning up that workbench because for a while there, if I'm at the bench and I know like a major shift's going to happen, if I know that, okay, tonight I'm going to finish construction and tomorrow I'm going to paint. Yes, I will do some major bench cleanup to prepare the area for painting because I, I echo what was said earlier. When you walk in, you don't want to You don't want to have any obstacles because you want to just jump right into it. But I think for me, those obstacles come when I go through certain phases of the build where construction, you know, my bench is oriented in a way where there's drill bits, paint, sanding sticks, sanding sponges, clippers, exacto blades. And it's very focused on that aspect. Once I go into the painting stage, it's a whole nother disaster, but a disaster that I can manage. And it's around paints, brushes, airbrush thinners, like everything that could smell is at my bench, paper towels, tin. So, and I keep what's nice is I have these little trays. You can pick up my bed, like a dollar store between those stages. I'll throw everything in that little tray. Sometimes I'll take it over to the wall, you know, into the closet and put it away in the, sh- in the shelving unit or drawers. Some days I'll just let it sit on the bench and guess what? My next project's right behind me. So I just pull the construction tray over and then I go right after it. So I think long story short, it depends, um, but it's also my comfort level. Now there's always opportunities to improve and become more efficient and you know feel better, I guess, at the bench. But right now, I, I like this chaos and I can operate in it. So that's uh, that's where I am. JB's comfortable chaos. I like that. <laughs> I think Adam's talking more, uh, you know, and you bring up great points, both of, you know, TJ, JB, everybody's brought up some great points. And I think the perspective is that it might not be that you have to clean your entire bench, but you have to clean that, you know, maybe straighten up that little two by two spot that you're working on, you know, and just that little area. Cause you know, I'm like everybody else. I've got paint everywhere. I've got, and I'm like JB, I've got little trays everywhere with figures in them and I've got models in them and I, and I'll pull them around and stuff like that. But if I, if I can, 
before I go to bed or before I get done for the night or whatever I'm doing or go to work in the morning, I'll, I'll clean around the mat, just the mat. So I'll take the paints off the mat. I'll wipe the mat down. So when I come in later on, when I have a few minutes, you know, of course there's, you know, 29 different bottles of AK and Citadel paint around the mat, but there's that, there's that clean spot where I have that little, just little thing where there's no sprue, there's no, no fuzz, no nothing like that, where I can paint. And I got my brushes out or I have my, my tools out. And I, I, I do know people that completely clean their desk off at night and they clean it, you know, and it's just the way they are. You know, I find a lot of those people are ex-military because they're used to cleaning all the time. You know, myself, I just clean that little tiny spot and that, you know, and that helps me when I come in at the next time I, I have some time and I can paint or do whatever. And it's just that perspective of that, just that clean spot, you know, and I really, really resonated with me, Jensen, with this video, and I don't mean to go too long, but there's there's some fantastic quotes in that. You know, he talks about, we all know our brain and we know how to uh, use our brain, but we can never control our brain. And, and, you know, when I think about that quote is that, you know, we all know what we want to do. We want to make this you know, this model this certain way and everything we do. But sometimes our brain says, no, you know, it turns out differently. You know, it might be worse. It might be better. We don't know. And you, you have to accept and embrace those changes of what you design or you paint or what you make. I mean, if you always say, oh, it's not the way I want it and I'm going to throw it away, you're never going to you're never going to produce anything. You're never going to be go forward anywhere. So embrace those failures, embrace. I've seen like Sam Dwyer was a perfect example. A couple months ago, he was working on the Wildcat that I think uh, Jay, uh, TJ's working on right now. And he had a problem where he dropped it and he you know broke the glass out of part of it and he embraced it. He got a new one. He fixed it and it's on. It's, it's going on. He didn't get upset, throw it across. Well, maybe he did, but you know, I, he finished it, you know, and, and you have to accept those challenges in, in your life. And it, th this video is, is very important, I think, for people to see because, you know, we all make mistakes. There's not a single person out there and I dare anybody to find the perfect modeler out there. There's, you know, we know some great modelers and they all talk about every single one of them talks about stuff that they've had problems with and how they got past it and stuff like that so just enjoy it you know jensen and um we talked about you know i really related to the the imposter syndrome comment but another thing that he brought up that i hadn't really ever thought about and i'm curious uh, to kind of get everybody's input but he said when he hits a project that he's invested a lot of passion into a really big project or something that he's really passionate about. Um, when that's finished, there's always this, this kind of separation anxiety, or I think he used kind of a similar to postpartum depression analogy. And that's, that's kind of happened to me where, you know, you've got a project, you really, you really care about it. You finish it up, you're excited about it, but then you go down to the bench and you kind of sit there and you stare at your pile of kits and you kind of wonder, Oh man, what's next? I mean, do you guys ever experience, anything like that yeah and it, it kind of like talking about his his postpartum depression for, as he put it for lack of a better term and and not to try to co-op that but he that was a good analogy i think but um i, I do that and obviously you know like i'm speaking for myself and probably the rest of you like all of our projects are pretty low stakes you know i know john's done stuff for publication i've done stuff specifically for review where obviously you don't want to screw it up because it's almost kind of like a job but other than that most of what we do is is really low stakes right you screw up a model kit okay it's not a commission it's just something you wanted to build so it doesn't really matter you're not going to make anyone upset other than yourself that being said you can still invest a lot of yourself into a project and i know i've I've done, I've worked on a project and and thought that I really crushed it. And I'm like, yes, this is awesome. I'm done with it. I'm super happy. And then I come back down to a relatively clean bench and I'm like, what should I do next? And I'm like, oh, I don't, don't really know. And then I kind of get something and I'm building it. Then I like these feelings start to creep in. I'm like, I might've peaked with the last build. I don't know. Like this one isn't going to hold up to that. Right. And then that kind of, then you're like, then why even bother? Kind of, I mean, again, the only person I'm like trying to impress is myself, but I'm a tough customer sometimes. <laughs> so it's, you know, and, and uh, yeah, I, I guess that kind of is, is leading into this. Hopefully that kind of is in line with, with what you were saying, but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It sucks. You know, when you, when you absolutely crush something and you think it's so awesome and you're like, Hmm, now what? This could have been it. This could have been the best thing I've ever done. 
Because because eventually we're all going to get to that point, right? One day you're going to you're going to build something and you're going to put it out there and it will be the best thing you will have ever done. And you'll never, ever do anything better than that. You won't know it at the time, but eventually you'll look back and be like, that was it. That was my that was my peak. That's where I crested. And and you your bills, I mean, it's not for any. That's the way life is like, right. Our eyesights are all are going to go. Your hand eye coordination is going to start to fail. Eventually, building models is going to be super hard. And they're just not going to be what they were, right? That sucks to think about, but that's, I mean, it's just like in your professional life, especially with like the type of work that I do. Eventually, I'm not going to be able to do it as well because I'm going to be old and building models the same way. So, yeah, those little like negative thoughts will like pop into my head sometimes. I'm like, oh, man, this like this tractor I built, this may be the best thing I ever do. I may not do anything better than this. That's not fun. And then you just kind of like move past it. And, and hopefully I always have, hopefully I don't get to a point where I don't, but so far I've, I've always been able to move past it. You know, TJ, I really appreciate that perspective. I, I'm a big fan of Dan Carlin, um, hardcore history, and he's got a side pod, uh, podcast that he does called hardcore history addendum. And he interviewed Rick, uh, Rick Rubin, who's a really famous music producer. If anybody knows music, they know this guy, he's worked with everybody and he has written a book about the, the act of of create, creating something. It doesn't matter if it's music or writing a book or building a model or whatever. And he talks about this idea of the muse, you know, and this people that create, especially for a living, they always have this fear. Is the muse going to, am I going to be able to always tap into this? Or have I, like you said, TJ, have I tapped out? And um, I think recognizing sort of some of these negative emotions and figuring out how, how to deal with it is something that we should be prepared for, you know, Know, Doug, as you do that, you know, one of those perfect grade Falcons, I could see maybe that being a candidate for something or, or JB, that um, 16th scale Stug that you did, you know, you, you invested a lot of time into that model. And, you know, as that comes into the finish line, I could definitely see that sort of potentially coming into play for, for any of us. I'm sorry. I don't mean to jump on, but it, it, I agree. Uh, you know, this is, there, there's, there is a, you know, J, uh, TJ's hundred percent right. There's that limit. You know, there's that there's that finish line or that peak line, you know, for all of us out there. It it, it might not be today. It might not be tomorrow. But, you know, it's just and and like you said, too, it's also like it's like everything in life. You're only the fastest runner for so long and then somebody else comes along. And so you have to think about things like that. Now, going back a little bit more to the question is, do I personally do I find it harder after I've completed a long project to start? start something new oh god yes i'll sit there and look at models in my boxes and or my stash and go okay i'm gonna do this well no i i don't want to try that that's not i'm not going to do that that well or and i'll just fluctuate for days yeah, i i definitely definitely can understand that it's it's very i think it's very hard after you complete a hard project like that to get that motivation back because you were so you were so focused on that one thing or that that vignette that diorama that vehicle that airplane the car the, the ship whatever that that it, it's hard to to get that back right away or even you know it might take some time you know sometimes it takes i know guys that build one or two models a week a year so between time it you know they we all have jobs we got to work but we have to work and we have to find that time but they just you know they don't have the motivation to go jump back into things you know again it's all me this is all my opinion is that you know it's definitely hard once you finish a project to restart something new and it's rare that you find the people that can you know just turns magnificent things out it's it really is and I, I really respect that but for me it's just it's it's a pain in the butt yeah this is an interesting topic you know i've, I've been thinking a lot about it since we've we've even started the conversation and even before you know it kind of goes back uh, a little bit of what tj said and i, I don't know my my viewpoint maybe is a little different but someday like like tj said this will all end everything you know, modeling at the bench, attending shows, going to meetings. And I hope I'm starting to get that perspective. You know, this is, again, maybe this is tangential to the discussion, but I think of moments related to the hobby. So when I lived in Pennsylvania, I remember the last Three Rivers IPMS meeting I went to. And I remember sitting there and thinking, this is likely the last time I will ever be in the room on a Friday night outside of Pittsburgh, enjoying the company of these club members. And instead of dwelling on it, I was like, man, I can't, this is great. Let's, let's talk models and let's go to pizza beer afterwards. And it's no different than other shows. Like 
for Telford. I don't know when I'm going to be back, but damn, I'm going to have the time of my life when I'm there. And I think I take that same approach on projects too, where like TJ said, one day you're going to build the best thing you are ever going to build. And you're not going to know it at the time. And I think that's the beauty of it. I think that, you know, if you can build something and you have that, I don't know, just the attitude of, all right, what's next? Um, I don't know. That's just my opinion. I, I try not to get bogged down in these things. And I'll be honest, I just try not to overthink the hobby. I really do. And I hate the word competition. I think it's one of the dumbest things we can do in this hobby. And I'll stick by that. I, I think it's okay to have our work judged, but it's very difficult, I think, to compete against one another. I love having my work evaluated and people telling me you know, where I'm at on a certain level, but I honestly don't like competing against people. I just, I don't know. If I want to compete, maybe I'll go play some golf or, or hockey. But in my mind, it's the word competition. It's motivating in some cases and it can be very detrimental in others. And I've been on both sides. It kind of ties in with you've, you've made that project. You you have this, you have this sometimes a delusion of grandeur, sometimes not, where you walk into a show, you put it on the table, you're super proud of it. People are proud of you for bringing it. And then the judges don't reward it. And I think that having that stick with you, is that's the detrimental side. That's why competition, I'm not a huge fan of because it, it can destroy someone. You know, it's it's happened to me in some regards where, you know, you, you, you again, we, you put so much time, effort into a project, you bring it to the table, you think, oh man, oh yeah, I'm good. And then not so much. So I guess I'm waffling all over the place on this. And it, I don't know, it all comes back to, at least in my mind, just, trying to do what makes you happy, to be honest. Um, you know, follow the principles that Adam talked about, but also you got to find your own way too sometimes. And um, you, you got to be really thoughtful on those experiences, whether it's building, whether it's at a show, interacting with people and uh, getting over those hurdles. I'm not going to, I'm not going to dismiss there's hurdles or mental blocks in this hobby. I, it's clear as day with everyone. And if you haven't had one, I'll be honest, uh, you're probably a liar too, um, because it happens to everyone. Uh, I guess it's it's really comes down to how do individuals handle it. And I think maybe in addition to kind of what Adam said is is the people that you surround yourself with, because it isn't solitary. It's it's it takes a team a lot of times. You know, my co-hosts here have been you know critical in those moments where I thought I was going to launch a you know a T34, yeet that back to Russia for crying out loud. Um, <laughs> you know, so, some people were kind enough to point me in the other direction. Or, you know, whether it's a base or figure, um, regardless, I, I think, you know, you don't have to do it alone. That's what I'm getting at. Broken and wiper blade, John. Broken. Hey, that's in the mail right now. I got the tracking number. I'll give it to you. So like, I, again, I'm just, it's a hard topic for me to discuss because it's, it's unique for everyone. And it's, it's something that it'll really make you think. And I think maybe that's the biggest thing coming out of this is to think, understand and find what makes not only you happy, but can make you move forward. And you don't have to do it alone, as we've mentioned. Uh, there's excellent support networks, whether, whether it's professionally or even just our friend, just a group of friends from the hobby, um, and focus on that aspect. So I'll I'll yield the floor. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm really bad for the whole imposter syndrome thing. And it's something Adam mentioned. It's like usually 70% into a project, all of a sudden he feels like I I am such an imposter here. Like when he worked at um his old place of employment, he, he always had that thought that someone was gonna attack him on the shoulder. He's like, hey, get out, you don't know what you're doing. And I get that. You like through through many pro I think nearly every project, I get to that stage and it's usually is the 70% mark, usually after it's built and painted and we're at that stage like after a pin wash where I'm all of a sudden like I have no idea what I'm doing now and a bit like what JV said it, it can take a group of friends to really straighten that out usually it's TJ saying cut that out get on with it usually really helps it's like yeah he's right I, I do actually know what I'm doing for some reason I'm pussyfooting around the 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 fact that just get on with the stages I know exactly what I need to do for some reason my mind wants to question itself into thinking, yeah, but do you want to do this first or this first? Or do you want to use this type of product or this? What sort of environment is it going to be weathered in? Is it going to be a light or is it going to be dark? It's like, you know what you're doing, just kind of get on with it. And it kind of comes from that overthinking nature I think many of us have. It's easy to say, just don't overthink it because it's like, well, thanks, that helped. I'm not thinking anymore. But at the end of the day, like the guys have mentioned, just a different perspective. At the end of the day, this is just models. It's yeah. just plastic, small little items that we like to paint and display. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And John, sorry to get back to something you said, John, 
about how this affects everybody. This is Adam frickin' Savage working at Lucasfilm and telling people that he is expecting to get tapped on the shoulder. I mean, this is one of the top modelers in the world. So if he's feeling that, we're all going to feel it at some point or another. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a fair statement. We're all rookies in every aspect of life at some time. Uh, I'm a true, I, I believe this. I live this in professional life, hobby. I fake it until I make it. And that's with everything. And it could be reading a book to fake it. It could be just confidence. You'd be surprised how much that, you know, just simply having confidence behind what you're doing, even if you're making it up, can go a long way. Now, granted, there's a there's a road to gaining that confidence and there's, you know, support and minor victories along the way to build it. But I, I'm every day fake it until I make it. And it's it's pulling out a battleship turret or the P-51 at the Musaru. Like I'm still faking it with aircraft. No bones about that. You know, I have some books to guide me. I have some really good tutors, you know, Steve Baker, my consigliere for the P-51. Jeremy Moore is someone that I really admire and look up to. Like those folks um, can certainly help. Um, but it's, it's at the end of the day, I, I'm faking it, man. I'm, I'm just rolling with the punches and seeing what sticks against the wall and just trying to be comfortable with it too. I think it comes back to your inherent comfort level with that. And even goes on at shows, to be honest. You know, it's, it's when someone comes up or you're talking about your build and you're like, well, I just kind of made that up when I was doing it. Um, let's try to sound educated about it. And then Sometimes you just let your guard down and you're like, hey, man, you know, I just literally started speckling stuff. I wish it was more scientific or, you know, mechanical or engineering process. Nah, man, I'm just winging it. It's cool. Um, and I and I hope you can do the same. But I'll give you, you know, the the, the parameters of my winging it. But there's there's no process going on here. Uh, I'm just faking it. And sometimes it just comes out right. Well, and it also double down on another thing you said earlier, John, regarding surrounding yourself with the right kind of people. All of you have done a project and you posted it in the group and you're frustrated. I mean, you're ready to bang your head against the wall. And most of the rest of us are looking at this project that you're frustrated with. And we're, you know, we're scratching our head going, dude, what are you, what are you talking about? Jen said, I remember that uh, Model T ambulance you did and uh, you got kind of stuck on that. And, you know, we were all just, man, what are you talking about? That thing's beautiful. TJ, you do that all the time as well, you know, and, and uh, I think it's just having Having people that um, you respect or that maybe that inspire you to put a, a fresh pair of eyes on the project and say, no, no, Grant, keep going. This this looks terrific. This is what I like. And, and a lot of times that can overcome, you know, that block in your head because we we want everything to be perfect, right? We see the vision in our head. And if we fall short of that, we get frustrated. And a lot of times we don't recognize that we've actually done some pretty good work. Thanks, guys. Uh, that was a really, really good uh, discussion. And it, I, it's always nice to understand everyone else's perspective on stuff like this because, like I said, negative thoughts and different negative perspectives um, obviously are different for everyone. Like like Scott said, if Adam Savage is also having these sort of thoughts, everyone is as well. So, yeah, it was it was really good to kind of get that out there, have a bit of a vent about the thoughts we have. And, yeah, it was, it was fun. Thanks for that. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, talk about the highlights from the Posse podcast groups. So um, we're going to start off with Scott and his shout out. Yeah. So um, as I was kind of going through the posse this week, I found a model that for me was a little bit unusual that really caught my eye. And Steve Evans uh, posted one of the new Airfix uh, Avro Ansons and uh, really stunning. I mean, first of all, I think it's probably got to be one of the best Airfix kits ever, if not yet, if not certainly one of the top ones, but really beautiful kit. And uh, Steve has captured um, that are, you know, classic RAF, dark earth, dark green camouflage beautifully. There's a lot of canopy framing. Everything's really sharp. I mean, just Steve did a really great job. So yeah, my, uh, my pick is the Airfix 148 scale Anson done by Steve Evans. Yeah, it's a really, really nice build and, and, and nice paint. Like you said, it's really, the colors on it are fantastic. Jensen, what about you? Um, well, I had to get this in before everyone else took it. Um, Steve Baker's MQ8B. Uh, wow. It's astonishing. 
Like the the fire scout, is- just just call it a fire scout. Well, We're trying to be Mr. Cool Guy. It's a fire scout. <laughs> fire scout. So my friends work for the Navy, so I have to be exact. <laughs> That's what Jensen's saying. Yeah, I'm like I know people. Um, <laughs> the thing is, you are these people. Um, anyway, the fire scout. Yeah, gorgeous, beautifully built, very like just clean build but then when it came to all the pre-shading and paintwork oh my lanta as jay would say just just so pretty like the pre-shading in different tones there's a few browns in there a few reds so when he's gone over with the bluey gray color it's just ugh. light ghost gray is that color light ghost gray there we are yeah it's it's just it's just gorgeous i mean just just go and look at it it's stunning um never really a subject that caught my attention really but having seen it now it's like yeah one of those might have ended up in my basket because it's just it's just (laughs) stunning yeah he that like like you said the appreciating on that i I remember when he put the first photos up i was like what the and i was it it was just like you said browns reds rust color almost and you know and 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 he just nailed it with the, the gray and then it came in with the decals or the decals just, I mean, they're so sublime, but still they just, that just kick that kit off really well. They do. It, it's a neat little kit. Just so you know, there's also a new one coming out with folded wings and armament. So there is another one coming out with a trailer also. All right, JB, what about you? Yeah, so just highlighting on Steve's too, he did a really good job recreating the rivet detail and the spines that are sanded away. So highly recommend anyone building that kit, pick up the Quinta rivets that you can use. Very nice. And I'm going to go on. I picked Luke Carswell's Battle of the Audrang diorama using Rubicon models, Huey. I think, uh, you know, the multi-level is really cool, but also I just love the helicopter. I, I think Rubicon has really done a fantastic job jumping into the kind of the skill modeling aspect of Wargaming. And it certainly attracted me on some of their builds. And man, the Huey is awesome. And I'll be honest, I like the rivet detail that's kind of mm-hmm. over-exaggerated. I, I just, I think it's cool. Is it accurate? Meh, I don't really care. But I, I think it just adds such, you know, a visual aspect to that. You put a wash on it, you give it a little dry brushing here and there. And Luke's has certainly done a really nice job on his. So I look forward to getting that kit at some point to build a helicopter. Yeah, these Rubicon models, you know, your your kit that you dropped of the LVT, this kit, I mean, they're just doing amazing, you know, work. I don't I don't do war gaming. I know TJ does, but you know, I I need to get some of these kits. They're really incredible. I know Grant, you think pretty highly of them as well. Oh yeah, they they they're they're fantastic and they're models. I don't care what anybody says. They're they're models. You know, they've come out with a new line for their Vietnam War uh, series. They've got mm. BTR 60s, the T55, T50 Fours. They've got figures now in plastic. They're doing fantastic work. One thing I just do want to mention about uh, Luke's diorama is that one gold. Uh, he won a gold and a best in show for that diorama as well. Yeah, um, at the local show this weekend, which is just incredible. Well deserved. Well deserved. All right, TJ. What about you? So mine's hot off the presses. It's uh, Ken Childress has been. He recently joined the group, and um, he also recently got a 3D printer. And he's been designing pieces for M18, sorry, not an M18, an M8 and 48 scale. And uh, they're, they're quite cool. Yeah, he did some really good. He did the uh, ammo crates that go on the bottom of it. He did the ammo, the ammo loads and stuff like that. Really nice work. Uh, Doug, what about you? Um, I chose somebody trying something new in their on their bench is Adam Jackson. Um, he's doing a P38 and he's trying new stuff. And he's been going to a lot of our our friends like Steve Baker to to give him give him some inspiration. He's black facing for the first time. And, you know, when it when he when he first started and he got the first coat of green on it, he thought it was a little a little darker than he wanted. But then he started taking advice and looking into things and he's added post shading and a few other things. And it's really starting to pop. It's really nice looking. And what I really appreciate is him sharing his journey of learning something new and, you know, trying new uh, uh, new techniques. So it's 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 a fun little journey. I recommend everybody check that one out. Give him some support. Yeah, Adam's a great guy. We got to meet him over in uh, in Denver and just uh, kind of n- relatively new in the hobby, but is really coming, you know, sort of like Martin Drayton. He's coming fast and uh, learning, learning quickly, but just a great guy. And uh, um, I agree with you, Doug. It's good work and it's good to see somebody going outside of their comfort zone. So keep up the good work, Adam. 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. So I, I found a new modeler. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him before. He's a young guy. His name's Jeremy Moore. I don't know if we all heard of him before. No, just kidding, Jeremy. Uh, your 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 P thirty eight J. The paint is it is is fantastic. It, it really is. I mean, what you know, it's just you can't you can't compete. Um, he did a P thirty eight J, which is the new uh, Tamiya kit. You know, the metal all metal basically kit of the P thirty eight. It's the uh, moonlight uh, cock. Tail is the version, I guess, flown by a specific officer. I didn't get the name of the officer. I'm sorry, but so it's just it's just fantastic. Seeing guys like this showing us their work is just makes me strive to get be better. And you know, I really, really enjoyed that one. And he, he walked us through the process through the whole thing on this on the website too. So which was very nice. It was a really good kit. You're gonna see that on the not this issue, but the next issue of TMMI. It's yeah. on the cover. I I, yeah. I think Marcus put it on the cover. So yeah, looking it, forward to seeing that for sure. It definitely does deserve to cover it's beautiful the color it just it's just some fantastic work why don't we head over to jb and find out about some upcoming shows and events thank you so much jensen we have some really i mean some of these events are epic it's unfortunate that i'm uh, stuck in the middle of the country and they seem to be on the coasts but in may especially that uh, you know that first weekend we're looking at mfca at the Radisson Hotel, Philadelphia East. For those that don't know, that is a premier, you know, figure show. They do have ordinance there, but it it is mainly figures and it's it's world class. You know, you'll see Bill Haran there and, and the likes of Europeans as well that we all know and love from online. So if you're in the Philadelphia, New York City area, New Jersey, definitely check out MFCA. Mm-hmm. It's awesome, but rather unfortunate, too, on that same day and on the weekend is the Amps International Show. Now, that's being held at Camp Hill, PA, right outside Harrisburg. It's the two-day international show. Now, that's armor-oriented. For those that don't know Amps, Armor Modeling and Preservation Society, all focused on armor. Now, granted, you can enter sci-fi, I believe, and figures as well, of course, and dioramas. But that's certainly shaping up to be a great show. Wish, wish them well. Always, always, always a great time. It is May 5th and 6th, but I think they have activities on the 4th as well. They typically start getting things rolling on uh, that Thursday. But I think TJ is definitely going to it. And Jensen is not, of course, because you're in England. Uh, I, for some reason, wanted to say Jackson, but I said your name, but I love you both equally. So I guess it's synonymous. Uh, but I think TJ, you're going with uh, you're, you're going with Jackson, right? Yeah. So originally I was, I was planning on going to MFCA. Uh, my wife was going to go with me. We we're going to make it kind of like a weekend. I was going to go to the show. She was going to go see her cousin. We were going to spend the evenings together. She changed her mind. And uh, I did not want to drive four hours to Philadelphia by myself. So I am instead going to drive the hour and 40 minutes it takes to get to Camp Hill, uh, Pennsylvania to go to the Amps Nats. And I just started an Amps chapter, as we talked about last episode, probably would be good to go spread the word about our chapter and um, meet all the other amps people. I've never been to an amp show, even though I've been an amps member for a number of years, I have started my own chapter. So I thought it'd be good to sit uh show face and, and there's going to be a ton of people there that I know Dave Hobbs is going to be there. Steve Munsell is going to be there. Angel will be there. Um, you know, Stephen Reed, I think will be there. And, and obviously Nuke, Jackson nuke man, Mike. Yeah. Mike will be there. So yeah, I'm not staying at the hotel. I'm going to get a hotel five minutes away um, on points. Cause I can do that. Thanks to uh, working in North Carolina, but yeah, looking forward to it. Leave straight from work on Friday and get there around noon. Wow. And then after that, we have the San Diego Model Expo, which is Saturday, June 3rd at the San Diego Air and Space Museum Annex. That's going to be sweet because that museum's awesome. Uh, Grant, are you going down to that? Oh, yeah, I'll definitely be there. Um, it's a it's a decent little small show. Um, it's cool because the annex is right off the airfield. So you have all the aircraft right there. It's, you know, F-14s, F-15s. Um, you know, that's how I put the 14 first, Steve. I'm sorry I didn't mean to do that to you, Mr. Baker. They have all kinds of, you know, foreign aircraft there. Uh, it's, it's a huge, it's, it's, it's a huge vendor event too. Uh, there's a lot of vendors there. The uh, San Diego IPMS group throws on a great show. It's always fun and I can't wait to be there. Awesome. And then the next big event is the IPMS Nationals in San Marcos, which is August 2nd through the 5th. And it is going to be absolutely fantastic. I'd like to stop on this topic real quick and just 
go around the horn really, really quickly and, and talk about, you know, what's that? You got to pick one project to take the Nats. What is it? Is it in progress, finished, or or even not even started? So I'll, I'll just go. I'm, I'm looking to take the big 116 scale Andes Tiger One. That's going to be the uh, the Nats project where I'm going to post probably put most of my energy after this FJ's done and and crank that out for the show. So let's just go around the horn. TJ, you're unmuted, so I'll, I'll go to you. Uh, mine's a Sherman Three from Asuka. I've started it. It's still got a long ways to go, but it's um, the one I decided to do after Nats last year. Thanks to uh, Dave Hobbs, he sent me a new TMD resin hall because i got one that was not so good he had one that was perfect fit right on there so yeah that is my my nats build if you will something um i'm gonna probably pretty soon gonna start pumping a lot of a lot of effort into awesome let's go across the pond to jensen i know this is a trip you've been certainly looking forward to for a long time so what's on your bench for it um, I really want to do the best possible job I can with the, the 1918 Austin Armored Car, the, the Japanese service one. Doing everything, like full interior, the engine, everything about it. I'm just going to do the full kit. Just going to try and make the best possible job I can with it. Ian kindly got me that for, for the Secret Santa. He knew I, I wanted that kit for, well, since it was released. I just love the, the camouflage pattern that it's in with the Japanese service. Really want to kind of create the, the box art with the uh, kind of long grass and I don't know what it's called. It's like an archway. They're in Japan, the Japanese archway. Uh, so there's that on it. Uh, I wanted to create the box art. Uh, and, and yeah, it's, I just want to kind of really push myself to do the best I don't want to say most perfect model because I don't know if that actually exists, but we're going to go with that. Uh, I just want to throw everything I have at that build. Awesome. I can't wait to see it. Like you said, that box art is certainly inspiring. I love it. It's gorgeous. Sweet. We're going to come back across the States. We're going to go to the West coast. Grant, what's on the, what's, what's top tier for, uh, for Nats for you. I, I want to finish up my, uh, I want to do a collection this year. Um, so I have four, no, three painted dwarves. So figures, I want to do five based up. All of them got um, coins for what their services are. So I'm totally nerding out. So I think that's going to be my 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 uh, my collection I want to do for finish up for that. So I'll have the four, the five of them done, different armor, different um, stages. So that's that's my nerd thing. I've got a one and a half to finish up. So it'll take me a little bit long time to finish that up. And uh, that's going to be my that's going to be my magnus opus, I guess you can call it for Nats this year. Sweet. Definitely looking forward to it. All right. We'll go back over to Scott. Scott, what's number one for you? I think what I'm going to do is try and get my Panzer one finished. Um, I've got a really cool scheme, you know, that isn't gray um, that I'm planning on kind of an initial war scheme that I really like, and I'm pretty close on it. So I think uh, should be able to get that done. Um, so yeah, that Tacom Panzer one house for a, so that's probably uh, the one that I'm going to bring John. Sweet. That's awesome. Well, that's certainly a, a good lineup. I can't wait for all of us to get them done. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of other projects on the back burner too, that we're looking to finish for Nats, but really cool to talk about, you know, what's that number one. And, and I encourage our listeners, if you are going to Nats, please let us know what's your number one project. What's, what are you hoping to bring to the table? What do you want to show that everyone at the show that, that you've been working so hard on? We'd love to hear about it. Please post a picture in the Plastic Posse Facebook group. Love the engagement, love the interactions, and we'll certainly talk about them on the next episode. I'll quickly round out the following shows. We have Orange Con in uh, Buena Park, California on October 1st. Grant will likely be there. We have Pax Con, which is the geek show. I wish I could make it. I don't know if I can, but that is the Hollywood Volunteer Fire Department in Hollywood, Maryland on October 7th. I encourage everyone on the East Coast, please go to that show. Great group of guys looking to do something different. And I really, really can't wait to see some of the results from what they're going to do. Uh, so major kudos to Darren and the team. And then lastly, we have Scale Model Challenge in Eindhoven, October 14th to 15th. We will certainly talk about that later because it is going to be absolutely fantastic. And there'll be a good contingent of the Plastic Posse going there. And then rounding out the shows for this year that we know of, and if you have any, please share, is the MMSI show in Chicago at the Marriott in Schlumberg. Uh, that's October 20th through the 21st. Barry Bidinger and Jim DeRogatis from Small Subjects. That is a major show that they're a part of. We want to encourage everyone to have that on their list as well. And I know Scott and maybe Grant's go into that. Yeah, we're, we'll both be there. So with that show list, we're going to pass it off to TJ to talk about the Mac group build. The Triple P Mach-A Group build is sponsored by Bases by Bill. Bases by Bill specializes in making beautiful, crafted, wooden custom display solutions for your scale models, built by modelers for modelers. 
These premium quality display cases and innovative base designs are available for just about any size of model. These custom sized display bases range from 4 to 30 inches, providing the perfect foundation for dioramas or vignettes. As a reminder, if you don't see what you need, ask! Chances are they can customize the perfect solution for you. Check out Bases by Bill and see the new custom display products for bus and figures. Use the code POSSE, P-O-S-S-E, at checkout to apply a 15% listener discount to your order. Bases by Bill for all your model display needs. All right. Yeah. So a couple of bills uh, we want to highlight uh, for the Mac Group build, which is coming to an end sooner rather than later um, because it is already the end of April. Lin Young has been making some good progress. He just posted up some photos of the pilot for the harness that he's uh, been doing. He kind of with like a red, I don't know if it's a, a undercoat, like he's going to chip down to it, but it's a cool color. It's like a, like a deep red. Um, of course, Bill Huffman, just the absolute ridiculousness in, in, in the, in a good way um, for his crazy ass build that he's doing. Um, I think he just released another video. Um, I don't know if it, that's in the group build, but his pictures have been in the group build. I definitely saw his video on, YouTube, I've not watched it yet because it's pretty long. I think it's like an hour, but um, I think it's a whole thing he's got going on. Um, or Craig Flynn has been working on a Luna Hun, which is the moon version of a Roaster Hun, which is a bipedal robot thing. Um, it's pretty cool. He picked a really interesting scheme. And of course, last but not least, gotta throw the throw a shout out to Cliff Herring and his his uh Easter egg riddled Mark Forty Four. Yeah, he's. I think he's starting final assembly, and um, I think from there he's going to go into the weathering. But Dan, that thing is cool. He's uh, <laughs> throwing Easter eggs in for everybody, uh, for all of us, and a lot of the the hardcore OG posse guys that have been around with us uh, for this uh, whole wild ride. And yeah, Cliff's a good dude. I can't wait to to spend some time with him and in uh san marcus and and to see his his awesome model because man i think it's cool yeah the utah silhouette is something i just picked up i i hadn't noticed that before <laughs> but i was like oh my gosh man i'm like i admire it i freaking love it and it's every, inspiring it's yeah. it's crazy he's he, i mean every picture you look at it you'll you'll initially look at it go, oh yeah that looks really good and then you'll be like oh oh man <laughs> there's another easter egg i missed <laughs> So, so I'll just go ahead and say this. My favorite one is the chipping pattern he put on the back with the fuel tank. The pattern is the state of Virginia, yes, which it is. is it's very cool. <laughs> you, w- you probably wouldn't notice it unless someone told you, which of course he told me. And of course, once you see, I mean, Virginia has a pretty distinctive shape. Um, once you see it, you're like, oh yeah, that's Virginia. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, and the fuel tank is the burgundy and gold of the Washington commanders. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just so cool. <laughs> I would have never thought of that. Right. Like that's the, that's, the, that's the level of model making that I'm, I'm not at. I, I feel like I'm proficient and I can do a lot of things, but when it comes to creativity of that style, I am not that. And the fact that, that he could do that and all the other technical aspects of his model making, because he's a damn good modeler. It, it, it's just, I don't know. It just tickles me. I mean, it really does. Every time I see it, it brings a smile to my face. Okay, let's uh, get into some feedback. Doug, what have we got? We're going to start with a uh, nice little note we got from Pete Jerry. He says, I have been enjoying this wonderful hobby since we all went into that lockdown a couple of years ago, along with quite a few others. I recently came across your podcast after listening to one, the one with Night Shift. My 13-year-old son is just starting out on his journey, too. He's participating in the Duke of Edinburgh scheme here in the UK. It's a UK scheme encouraged to encourage young people to volunteer, be adventurous, and try new things. We are going to participate in your $5 group build, and he actually uh, did the uh, adjustment for us. It's uh, 4.03 pounds. How do you break down pounds? 4.03, and what is it for? Yeah, what is that? Pence? Pence. Uh, yeah, four pound three P. Okay. Okay. Whatever. Yeah, well, Monopoly so money. <laughs> They will be participating in that starting May 5th, as mentioned on the latest show, which is the last show. Let's see. He goes on to ask if we would be willing to review his son's work for the the Duke of Edinburgh scheme that he's doing. Give feedback and tips. Anything we could do would be would be appreciated. Yeah, I responded to him and told him we would absolutely be happy to do that. So uh, looking forward to it. All right. And then from previous seat on Patreon, he, he had to correct me. 
for me. It's pronounced Grosserhund. I've been saying Groberhund because it's a freaking bee. I don't care if they make it swirly or not. It's a bee. So apparently it's That's a German S set. Or sharps a hard hard S in German and it makes the S sound, the double S sound. Just throwing out there for folks. Can't wait to see how it's turning out. Adam Greenwald said this about our Jethro Billing interview. He says, more Jethro, more laughter. You should do a questions for Jethro segment. I think he has a lot of knowledge to share. Yeah, Jethro's been uh, a really popular guest, you know, fantastic modeler from Montana. He's touched uh, a lot more lives than we ever could have anticipated that he would touch. I think he's at his proctologist or he he joined yeah. this episode. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm pretty sure that there'll be more Jethro Billings in, in the future. Gobbles. And funny, speaking of the Jethro Billings interview, Lay Smith said, uh, you almost ruined a perfectly good cockpit canopy with that interview. <laughs> that's fantastic feedback sorry about that but hopefully every <laughs> everything turned out all right i want um, to meet santiago who who was part of the interview <laughs> yeah <laughs> santorini that tj hammer guy kids. <laughs> <laughs> tamoya yeah <laughs> Remember that you can send your feedback and suggestions to us via email at plasticpossypodcast at gmail.com. All right, let's go into our interview. This time we interviewed the guys from Bases by Bill, Bill, Christian, and Wes. It was a great interview. Uh, we had some fantastic talk about all their new products, uh, some of their new items. They, they've got some great uh, bases. They've got some great stands. They've got a whole bunch of great things. We had a good talk with them. And let's go into the interview. Thank you all listeners for tuning in. We have a really special segment on this episode. We are very uh, pleased to be joined by the crew from Bases by Bill. But before I introduce them, I just want to note that on the line today, we have Grant Mayberry, Doug, Jensen, and TJ. Unfortunately, Scott couldn't make it. He's a little under the weather, but we wish him well. And he'll be chiming in maybe later in the episode. But really, the point of this segment is to focus on Bases by Bill. They are a sponsor of the podcast. We had the opportunity to meet them and get to know them at the last Nationals. But I've been fortunate enough to know their product for a very long time, and they've been so gracious to give us some time on this weekend, and we're lucky to have three of them. And I'll go around the room real quick. So we have Bill, the founder. How are you doing today, Bill? Good, good. Good morning to you. Outstanding. And then we have his son, Wes. Wes, how are you today? Good. How are you? Wonderful. And then lastly, we have Christian, who's part of the team as well. How's it, how's it going today? Hey, it's going great. Great to be here. We're going to kick this off with a general question, and it's probably going to be oriented towards you, Bill. You know, the others feel free. This is a team effort and feel free to jump in. But Bill, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, small town boy here from Waterloo, went to college, UW Stevens Point, had a number of jobs, uh, got in the post office, uh, got kind of hooked with the benefits wages. And I retired uh, probably, I don't know, it was two years ago, something like that. Started the company before that. The main thing I wanted to do is, you know, to try to find something to do for my retirement, because uh, there were so many guys that, that I knew of that retired that are, you know, looking out the window, sipping coffee, watching ESPN, or, you know, just goofing around, wasting time. And I, I, I always loved woodworking. And I really tried to find something that, it, not necessarily even a business, but something I'd enjoy building and, and sharing with people or selling or whatever. But woodworking, I've, I've, I've woodworked all my life and had, uh, uh, you know, we had shop when, when they used to have shop. I don't even know if they have it anymore. A couple guys lost thumb tips and, and stuff like that. So I, they probably don't have it anymore. But anyway, uh, so yeah, I just love woodworking, love being retired. I, I highly recommend it uh, getting there. And uh, <laughs> that's about it. Really happy, uh, you know, the way the situation is. So that's awesome. And you have your son right next to you. I think that's really cool. Wes, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm Bill's son, Wes. Basically a little bit of my background um, in my professional career. I'm a degreed mechanical engineer out of MSOE. Graduated back in 2016. My current job is I'm a fluid power engineer up in Sturgeon Bay. I work on mobile boat hoists, uh, gantry cranes, uh, forklifts for uh, marine and industrial environments. 
primarily work in food power in my degree field, you know, CAD design, product design, uh, mechanical design in general, you know, basically six years, six years plus experience in a variety of fields. Uh, so basically, you know, I kind of came along on board with the business originally. My, my dad was making, you know, simple bases. As the product started to develop, I, I saw there was a little bit more to it than just, just a board, you know, sand it up and cut into shape. The introduction of lasering, the introduction of 3D printing and CNC, you know, as a mechanical engineer, any opportunity I have to have access to components like a CNC or a 3D printer or a, a laser engraver, those are like tools in the tool belt or uh, as a kid in the candy shop, but those are, those are the tools in my trade and I, I enjoy those things. And the business has kind of helped to broaden my professional horizon a little bit. It's pushed the bounds for me to program all these devices and to design product. It's been a six-year journey to see where the base the base business has gone, and now we're into display cases and awards and such a multifaceted business. To do it with my dad and to do it at the highest quality that we are, and to do it with Christian, it's a wonderful thing. And my dad, he does the he does the hard work, <laughs> making it come to reality. That's an awesome story. We're certainly going to pull on that more. We'd love to learn more about the tools that you're working with. You know, lastly, I want to go to Christian, who's, who's I believe, not part of the family, but part of the business. Uh, Christian, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and then how you got introduced to these fine gentlemen we just spoke to? Actually, though my last name is different, <laughs> Bill's my uncle, Weston's my nephew. Oh, nice. So, <laughs> yeah. And I, I should say for the listeners, when we're talking about cities and places, we're actually in Wisconsin. I'm near Racine. The boys are up in Waterloo, just uh, east of, of Madison. My background is I've been in software technical development, website type things almost my entire career. I currently work for the world's largest collector auction company, the Mecham Auction Company, not to promote anything, but um, uh, on a variety of things there having to do with statistics, analytics, part of the marketing group. My story with Bill is really, he's the first person that I saw modeling. We would go over to see him when he was a teenager and he had these 30 second scale monogram armor kits. And one of the innovations I saw was that he knew how to use a can of spray paint. So his uh, Stug 3s and Stug 4s were all painted and they looked like something that might be real. So I was big into modeling in my teen years and then you know, with college and family and everything else kind of stepped away. And we would see each other at family gatherings and things like that. But a few years ago, met the guys at a show over in Iowa. We were living in Iowa at the time. And I kind of got back into the hobby. And just one thing led to another where we're talking about the bases and how it was starting to grow. At first, it was by word of mouth. And then I said, well, I, I have experience with websites. Why don't we try to reach a larger audience and see how that works? So we started a, an online store. And the main focus on that was really to get into Google, right? So as we've moved forward, because we can make everything, we can't list everything, but we try to list all the standard examples. One of the examples of things that we've done is by marketing our larger display cases for a particular ship or a particular Lego ship, like the Titanic. It's amazing how well that works in terms of people finding out about us beyond just the model community, but people that, that aren't part of the IPMS or the show community. What I take care of is, is that sort of listing, also coming up with marketing ideas. You know, we, we advertise on scale mates. We like Tim over there. He's been very kind to us. And also working on sort of the digitalization of the business, right? So that we have the ability to do a variety of things. And then in the past year, I've taken over the development of the artwork from which Weston was doing, but we have basically two channels there. One that we use for the painted bases where we're creating masks and another for the lasering that might be more difficult. And a lot of times that's muted emblems. Like if you think of the RAF unit crests or insignias, like we've got one cooking right now for the 502 heavy tank battalion for this new 16th scale tiger that Andy's concocted seems to be very successful. And we can make cases for those. I mean, that's that's the one thing is that we've got the triad, right? So I get the customers to find us. They ask us what we can do. Weston figures out how to do it. And then 
Bill makes it, ships it. I mean, it's it's almost like we're the three divisions of the company. You know, for 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 Weston and I, with both holding down full time jobs, it's a lot of extra work on the weekends and things like that. But the business is growing. We can talk more about some of the specific things that we're doing in terms of growing the business, but also some of the specific things we've done and learned so that we can grow the business. Like for example, Weston's done I think three or four iterations of the large case designs to improve assembly came up with this whole method by which the thing was knocked down so that we don't have to ship things in a big box. They're still heavy, but we can ship pretty much everywhere. But as you know, from looking at your your shipping, your mail call, shipping's pretty expensive and it's expensive for everybody. That's an example of the long-winded answer that you said was okay. No, that's a hundred percent okay. Thank you so much for that, Christian. I really appreciate you explaining kind of the triad there, you know, design, production, logistics, all of that. That's that's really exciting. I think we're going to drill down into each of those. And maybe to start this conversation, I'd go back to Bill and maybe talk about, I'd love to hear the personal story, the first show you were at, and you're probably thinking like, is this a good idea? Is this not? How's it going to be received by customers? And just kind of walk through that experience. And then maybe when is that moment when it clicked, like we have something here, this is special and we can really grow. You know, it seems like it happened a number of times where, you know, the very first time that I thought, well, I'll I'll try something. I, I made made a, a 48 scale Focke-Wulf uh, uh, 190. And I thought, you know, it would be kind of cool to have it on a Balkan cruise, you know, and, and I think I can make that out of wood. It's just linear, you know, I'll, I'll just cut it up and glue it together, flatten it. So I, I did that and I took it to uh, one of our club meetings. And I think it was in January or February of that year. And they, they, you know, people thought that was just wonderful. One of the guys took a picture of it, sent it to a guy and he ordered one. And I thought, you know, what, you know, I don't know this. What about this? You know, this is pretty cool. So our contest is in March, first week in March for Mad City Modelers. So I thought, you know, why don't I just buy a table and, you know, I got a month to crash and make a a million things or try to make stuff and let's see what kind of, you know, what we get. So we did. And I had rudimentary glued together, pieced together insignias, uh, rising sun. And I can't remember all the things I had. And people were, were, we're really digging it, you know, but, but again, then, you know, I thought, well, you know, we're kind of limited in what we're doing. There's only so much you can do piecing something together. You, you know, I don't, I can't do text and all that. And all this time, you know, we get into April and May and Wes, Wes all of a sudden comes and he goes, dad, you know, I, I saw where you can get a laser, you know, you can get lasers pretty cheap and they'll burn real nice into wood and cherry burns dark, burns very easy with the saw blade. So we got it. I don't know how small it was. It was like a 12 by 12, 10 by 10 little toy laser. And so we get it and it was just like, holy crap, yeah, this is, this, this is this pretty neat. It's taking forever to burn something, but when it burns it, it's, it, it burned it so dark and crisp. Yeah. Like, it And it wow, was, this, this really is something. This is really you can, something. You can really put some text and images on, on cherry. So we thought, well, let's get a bigger one because yeah. we got bigger things. So we got a really big one. We, we got an industrial one eventually. And it's again, and then the, the, I think that you were talking about the first time we went to nationals. I think that was Chattanooga. I'm not sure what year that was, but it was was probably a year or two after we started it, at least probably two years. We had, we had quite a bit of stuff down there. We drove to Chattanooga course. We loaded the Malibu. All I had is a Chevy Malibu. That thing was absolutely every square inch had something in it. And we drove down there. Yeah, that was, that was quite a show. But again, you know, each time, and we went to a a lot of uh, local shows at that time, just getting the, getting the word out and getting feedback. Every show we went to, we went to one in Missouri. I can't, I remember same thing. We just drove down in the Malibu, loaded it up and we, we sold $800 and three hours of, of stuff. And, and we left there. We thought we were, you know, we, we really thought we had something. So it was a number of incremental moments where, like I say, we introduced the laser. We were able to get these images clear and nice and, and they laser perfect. Then we thought, well, you know, let's let's see if we can burn through 
what do they call it? Uh, frisket. Oh, frisket. Burn it through frisket paper to to make uh, painted stuff. So you can laser, you know, laser the Polish emblem on there, or whatever, and peel off the parts that you need, and then paint the other color. Simple. And that started, you know, that was started kind of a revolution where we did a lot of uh, a lot of the painted insignias or or rondelles and, and things like that. And then when we got the CNC machine, we could do. Well, that ended up being the like the Astro case and and a number of other things which would have been very hard to hand do. You, you know, I, I've got a scroll saw where you could hand, hand do a lot of this stuff, but not not anything uh, a lot at a time. You, you, they're pretty much just uh, individuals. So, yeah, I mean the business the business really started off as just individual bases pieced together wood wood bases or even just standard you know like a piece of cherry or a piece of walnut just something to kind of put underneath your model help transport it help give it space on the table you know i always i always like to think of a, a model as a piece of art you know these guys put all this work and and effort into these things and they're immaculate in some cases and it's just i i almost compare it to like a the mona lisa or a van gogh painting where it is an absolute work of art and you're seeing what that artist sees and seeing the artist's personality. The products that we offer are very similar or very akin to like a frame around a, a timeless work of art. You know, you're not going to put that work of art just on the wall. You know, you, you can put that model right on the display table at a show and be like everybody else. Or if you, if you think you're, you have a timeless piece of art and you want to portray it as such, put something simple underneath it. You know, if you need a, a standard board, you don't want something flashy, just put something simple underneath it. Give it some space, allow the judges to pick it up and, and move it around and see it without touching the model. You know, no one wants their models touched, but ultimately it can be as simple as a board um, and, or as complicated as, as some painted you know, kind of in-flight display base with a unit logo or a unit emblem, um, something with some color, something to draw the eye. We, we try to offer a, a variety of products. We can go as flashy as you want, or we can go as subdued as you want. But ultimately, the business really started off with pieced together bases, simple bases, things that were easily made, you know, and obviously really good woods like cherry, walnut, Aspen maple. He's a woodworker. He takes pride in the wood he uses. We all do. You're not going to put a, a pine base underneath your model and spray paint it. We wanted to offer a premier product, something that complements the excellent model that is with it, you know, and, and elevates it and brings it to a, a timeless, a timeless piece of art type level. When we think about display cases now, we're probably not Lego modelers, but if you look at this Lego Titanic, right, it's 10,000 pieces. There's an interior. You can imagine a family working on it or a father or daughter working on it and they complete it. Well, now what? What do you do with it? I got a house full of cats, but I have this thing that we've spent months on. So we came up with a case that will nicely fit that with lights, because now once you put that Titanic in that case and put it, even if it's in a separate room or your main room and you have company over now, instead of a toy, you have a conversation piece. And, and this is something that we do in our advertising. We talk about if you put a model that you've made for someone in particular in the family or uh, for a veteran or for a specific thing, and you put it in a case you now have something that can be passed down in the family. Because of the lasering, we can put unit information, service information, individual people, where they service. It now becomes a snapshot in time. It becomes, I guess you could say, an heirloom, right? Instead of something that ends up at the thrift store when that person passes on, it's now something that's self-contained. It's been protected all these years, and it, it has a special value. So just like Les, Wes is saying, by having things in a case or even a simple base, it just makes things stand out. And Ivan, you have you would see this in your local shows there in the UK where we've noticed that just about everything on the table has got a base to it. You know, we've seen group builds. I remember seeing a Harrier group build from uh, 
your big show over there, which the name escapes me right now, but from a few years ago, right? There's like 60 Harriers on the table and every single one of them was on a base. So that must have been a requirement. It's sort of similar to the, the Mach A, you know, have a base for your display. So it's just kind of an interesting thing. And, and you know, going back to the, the evolution of the product, you can do things where you're piecing them together and you have a lot of labor early on. But as the demand grew, that's where really we started to lean on West because Bill was saying, these things take me forever to, I've got this book of business, this, this huge book of business and people are calling me saying, where's my product? And I'm working all the time. How can we improve our throughput? And that's where Wes went to work and said, all right, well, let's look at our production process for this and, and how can we improve or simplify or make it easier to make, and easier to ship. Yeah. Going back uh, to the beginning, beginning on display cases. I got to give credit to to Weston on it because I was not interested in getting into display cases. I really wasn't. It, you know, plexiglass, how am I going to cut plexiglass? You know, I, I didn't know anything about it. You know, I have the tools, but, you know, I thought that's just something else that, you know, how, how are you going to get these things glued together properly? How are you going to ship them? All of that. And I kind of fought it for a couple months until I thought, okay, well, we really should get one done. I Because I I don't, I'm not too crazy about those all plastic cases, you know, that are glued oh, together. You know, a lot of guys like them and that's yeah. fine. They, they keep the dust off, you know, and, and to each his own. But I thought there's, we, we can do better than that. We got to, we got to wood frame them. And uh, I finally came up with a, a process to, uh, to glue together the smaller frame cases. I think they're only three eighths of an inch thick and uh, able to, I use two part epoxy to glue them together. So they're, they're really together in, in, in small number four screws or whatever, but you know, and I thought, well, and, and then we, we got, I made, I think I made a sample out of some mahogany. It was uh, just a big case. It was 60 inches long by, I don't know, 18 tall, 11 or 12 wide out of mahogany, but it was not, I, I just built the case. It was not able to be broken down and shipped. Well, we put it up on the site and a dentist from Boston, he, he teaches dentistry at Harvard, I believe. He was our first customer and he says, yeah, I'll, I'll take it. And he just paid for it. And it's just like, how the hell are we going to get that out there? We can't drive. You know, I, I really, I honestly don't know what we're going to do. So I thought, well, I got to build something to carry it. So, so honestly, I bought, I don't know how much two by two and then uh, this thin plywood because it had to be shipped freight. Yeah. And I thought this man, this is crazy. So we, we, Built a sarcophagus. If you imagine in Indiana it was. Jones, like the, uh, the it was. lost ark yeah. at the end where they're putting the ark in the, in the government building. Yeah. That is exactly the type of crate we shipped this case in. It so was, it was in this. I, it's got hinges, it's got a, a lock on it. And I, I, I paid 120 bucks just for materials. So anyway, we get this case out there and it's freight. I take it, I, I take it to Madison to UPS to drop it off. And they're, they're forklifting this thing all over the place. Now this thing's just going to get, they're just, just going to get crushed. They're going to put a saw on it. Something's going to happen, you know, and it got out there and it got to the guy, but I can only imagine him trying to figure out how to get that thing out of there. So again, it's the total evolution of the business where you, you, you have to find a solution to that. There's, there's just no way around it. Otherwise, what's the point? You know, you're going to have to do this every time. And I am not doing this every time. <laughs> so Bill, figure out a way to, to make these things. This, you can disassemble them and, and a customer can put them together again and not be too complicated. Well, ultimately, you have to have the trifecta of the business. You need, you need to have premier product. You need to be yeah. to the customer and it needs to be. At right. And it's got to it's got to look nice. It can't yeah. be just something, you know, some a leg, a, you know, a tinker toy thing you put together and, and wrap it around your case. So that that evolved for a while. That took a while till we got something that that everybody was happy with. And then Weston putting the lights in. OK, we got to figure out a way to get the lights in there. And and again, something that the customer can assemble and it not be too, too difficult. Yeah, I mean, it. it- Honestly, um, snowballed from just being just simple boards into this. So then, yeah, business that just. OK, so then I got to I have to find boxes to ship the thing. So I get I get on the line with you line. The biggest box they have is for a twin mattress. So, OK, how much are they? Well, they're they're twenty seven dollars a piece. 
Okay, so so that's a cost. I have to glue up for these, you know, you know, cut them up and glue them up for different ones. How am I going to pack them? Okay, well, bubble wrap is how much. Uh, a big bag of peanuts used to be twenty. I think you could get two of them for like thirty bucks. Well, now after the p- pandemic, one bag was seventy-five bucks. Can't use peanuts anymore. They ain't going to work. So I thought, well, I had my daughter had an old quilt in the closet. Let's start <laughs> wrapping these things in blankets and quilts. Why not? You know, you can go to garage sales and get these things cheap. <laughs> and it's and it's wonderful because I, I just shipped a couple out in these brand new sleeping bags, big ones, you know, where you wrap the whole thing and people are getting it. Well, do you want me? You want this back, right? You want me to send it back or, you know, or, or no, no, no. I, you know, that's just a party gift from basis by bill you just oh, go ahead now i want to order something so i can you get go some ahead. sleeping gear so when i have <laughs> guests over i don't have to go out yeah, and the buy one it. Guy, i sent out the one i sent a, a sailing ship case out to a guy in denver and he got two sleeping bags and he he, he really thought that was something and he gave one to his boy and he had one so he comment that the sleeping bags he got from us were nicer than ones yeah had. something so like, like that like, i don't know the way that I have. but that's that's the that's the cool thing about the business where at times boy there you're up against something and it and uh, you got to figure it out the the shipping you know till we got shopify you take something to ups like that size at, at the counter and they want to just shoot you in the head because just just make an appointment have a have a driver come over and pick it up instead of driving it there all these things you know it's just starting a new business and making sure that you're not pounding your head against the wall that this thing, this is too much. You're, you know, you're, you're not going anywhere with this. Weston's hit me with a, yeah. on my leg. Yeah, so, yeah, I, yeah. so I guess yeah. it's time for me to quit. <laughs> no, no way. This is good. This is a great story. If anything, I kind of want to <laughs> dig into the production side of the operation and I'd kick it over to Grant to ask some questions about that. I, I really want to hear about what really interests me is you talked about your tools, your laser mm-hmm. cutters and going from a small to a large or CNC machines. How are you guys cutting the plant? Plexiglass, because that always, you know, that's always a big thing. And I can see we got laughter already. So. <laughs> well, my, it's, the answer is amazing. Yeah. The, the secret is, is that Ace Hardware will cut it for you. And they, they've got a huge cut. They've got a huge table and, and the sheets that they get are, uh, oh, they're some, I don't know that they're four by eight, but some of the sheets of Plexi that they get are at least six foot by four foot. And uh, they cut them for you. And it took a while for them because we're dealing with, I can't be much off of an eighth inch when I, when I'm doing a big Titanic case, we used to get the pieces back from them. I would measure them up and and make sure that they fit because if they didn't, um, it it just wasn't going to work, especially too big. You can't get the case together too small. You, you, you know, it wouldn't fit in the, in the groove. So it took a while before they they understood what I needed and and got their tool more more precision, I guess, set up uh, to cut precision. And the other thing, the smaller things, you know, sheets that are less than three foot wide or whatever, I, I can just, I got a, a, you can get a saw blade and cut them on your on your table saw. And, and that works pretty quick. You got to be a little careful. The the plexi chips, you got to be very careful and make sure you wear eye protection or you're, you're going to really get yourself into trouble. And if you're trying to do yeah. really small precision, precise cuts, the laser that we have now yes. is, is a high enough wattage. Yep. That it, it can cut right through the plexiglass. Laser oh, will get laser will give wattage. you a really nice edge. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's yep. the industrial grade laser you're talking about, right? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yes. Yeah. 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 The I, smaller I one, is, I think the smaller one was only five or yeah. not even 10 watts, and that didn't that couldn't cut through plexi. This is an example, you know, Waterloo, where the world headquarters of Basis by Bill is located, is, is a very small town east of Madison. And there are these hardware stores, which are sort of the hub for the communities there. And you might say, well, why aren't you guys, you know, buying it by bulk and this, that, and the other thing? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, with pandemic, it's extremely expensive. Number two, while it is true, we have standard size cases, like for the Titanic or a Missouri or a Bismarck or or even the three-sided cases, our whole thing is to build custom. So we would have a tremendous amount of wastage if we were buying pieces from commercial and it would be a huge investment. So yes, are we paying a little bit more? Yes. But we are the hardware store's biggest customer for plexiglass now. Right. (laughs) 
<laughs> and so when Bill comes in and, and works with them, they're happy to see him. You know, it's that sort of small town interaction. And so it works. It works now. Would it work if we were putting out 10,000 cases a year? No. But as a cottage industry, it works well enough for us. The same is true with our wood sources. Now, we, we've kind of, we can do a variety of wood sources, but we also have a range of stains. And the thing that's happened over the past, since the pandemic with wood prices, is they've almost tripled, in some cases quadrupled. So we've really focused in on the cherry because the cherry is the, first of all, it's a beautiful product. We buy it from a, a small provider of that here in Wisconsin, and we have that personal relationship with them. So it works great as just a wood. It works great structurally and it works great with the laser. So we use it kind of like other people would use other types of wood. It just, it works across all things. But again, you know, when you're in a small business and you don't have a lot of capital, you've got to be creative about how you work. And, you know, the plexiglass and the hardware store is an example of getting by with that cooperation with them. I don't know if you could, if you were in a big city, if you would get the same level of service and all that, but you see the same people at, at the ACE every week because yep. it's a family. They know, they know all bills walking in. I'm either ordering or picking up. <laughs> I, I'm going to say I'm out in Los Angeles and they wouldn't, we wouldn't get that kind of service. Right. right you know, right. it's, it's, it's fantastic. It really is. I I'm sitting here thinking I've got a 172nd DOS work world war one submarine with a dry dock mm-hmm. that I'm going to build. And I'm thinking, Oh my God, I want a case now. I yeah. so might say glass oh, case sure. with lights and all that, but I'm sorry, sure. I'm off on that one. You know, we also talked about other tools, you know, and I, I think I talked to you, Wes, at uh, I think it was either Vegas or in Nebraska. I can't remember. Okay. And we talked about you do a really good job of inlaying because I know you have some people will ask, hey, I want you to make a, a flat base, but I want you to drop it down in a quarter of an inch on the inside, you know, angle it out perfectly and all this kind of stuff. But now what kind of tools are you using to do that? So some of it can be, depending on the size of the base or what you're asking for, uh, some of it can be done manually with him, uh, with my dad. Mm-hmm. He can piece it together, right. kind of give you that little drop or little, little recess for a water line or right. a diorama base. Uh, uh, other times, uh, depending on the size of the base, of course, I, I can put it on my CNC. I've got a nice flywheel cutter that I can go oh, in wow. and do a flywheel cut. One of the other features I do on the diorama bases or the water lines uh-huh. is I'll take a piece of plexiglass too. And mm-hmm. if it's small enough to fit on my laser and it's a small enough area on the base, I can actually laser cut a piece of plexiglass that drop fits in there. Oh, wow. So then you can, you, I mean, as the modeler, yeah. you know, if you're doing a water line, you've already got a, a beautiful piece of plexiglass to start your water line with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, or otherwise, if, you, if you're making a diorama, you can put your diorama work on it and drop it in and out as necessary yep. on your base. Sure. Uh, drill a hole in the bottom so you can yep. push your finger up to get it back out. And, right. Because you know, I'm sure it's in and out a bunch of times. So yeah. that's a fantastic idea. I mean, yeah. you know, our listeners will enjoy. I mean, that's that's a I mean, things like that are, you know, it's it's just those little touches that you guys do that are just really fantastic. Now we've talked about mm-hmm. a couple other tools. Mm-hmm. I, I got it. I'm an engineer. By, yeah. <laughs> so I, I got to know what you got. What do you got? You got CNC machine. I said laser cutter. Do we, what else mm-hmm. are we talking about? So in terms of the 3D printers, I'll start there. You've okay. got a filament, a filament style 3D printer. Um, I think the area, the print area on it's seven by seven by seven, basically a seven inch cube. And then we have a resin 3D printer. I don't know what the square footage on that is or the square inch is. It's, it's not tremendously large, okay. um, but we use that for more of our finial product. Okay. Um, so we make little finials or little standoffs for right. uh, ship modelers. Right. Um, they include screws and nuts for them so they can mount their model to either our base or their own base. Mm-hmm. Then the CNC, we have a two foot by two foot CNC table. It's not a very large depth. I think the overall cut depth on it's like three to five inches. Uh, but for ultimately for what we're doing for our, our bent astro cases, for the water work, the diorama work, like we've just talked about, inserting coins for awards or doing inlays. We've actually done a couple wood inlays before. You don't really need a large depth, um, but the area is the, the important thing. Yeah, ultimately two 3D printers, the CNC, and then our 50 watt laser are really the, the four things that we use the most. I'm not going to re- reveal some future <laughs> innovations, but we we can say that doing the painted bases 
while we take great pride in doing that, it's a lot of work for Bill. It's a lot of work to create the design, which is what I do now. I'm not a designer, so I'm taking existing art and converting it to paths and things like that with an illustrator and other tools. But we're always looking for the opportunity to reinvest in the business. That's the other thing, as I would say, as a small business owner, which is what you heard Wes talk about is we started with something where we could understand the basics. And then as we saw production required something bigger, uh, we invested in that. The same is true for things like, you know, if we have a woodworking shop in the basement at the world headquarters, right? When you have a woodworking shop, you have dust. <laughs> so, you know, we reinvested in a better dust collect system, right? Because otherwise you can't live at the house. So <laughs> that would be a problem. And then also this year, we invested in a new type of sander. So then we took the old sander and we listed it for sale and it, it we sold that. So it's always this because we didn't have room to keep it, but also we would like to have the income. It was a good sander, but it wasn't good enough for what we wanted to do. So we're always looking for ways of reinvesting in the business to move us to that next level. There's some exciting technologies out there that are beyond sort of the woodworking that we're looking at for probably 2024 that would help us help us expand what we do. And also going back to the cases, I know we've talked about, you know, 200 scale Missouri's and Lego Titanics. One of the very first cases that Bill did was for a South Korean modeler whose name escapes me and I probably would not pronounce it correctly, but he came to us. He had this, uh, I think it was a 1700 HMS Dreadnought, mm -hmm. which in that one, didn't it have the anti-torpedo nets extended? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But he wanted a case, Bill made him one, and it's not very big, but it's, it was big enough to put his awards in the bottom of there. Oh, wow. That's great. This is the idea that if if you've done something special and at my age, if you're able to work with 1700 scale ships, God bless you. <laughs> you ought to have a free case with every purchase, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, that in, in his case, he got a small apartment, but he then he came back and bought another one for another ship that he had done. So, I mean, the thing about ship modelers is, as I'm sure you guys know and have interacted with people, is that is a massive investment in your time. And in fact, the recent, our recent show, I was inter talking to one of our people that come to the contest and typically they'll have about a year's worth of work into one of these things you know a 350th scale ijn congo a year working yeah. on it you know three or four nights a week not elapsed time but just the amount of effort so they're they're obviously base and case clients and you you can see you know and then we do stuff like this i'm a big in-flight modeler or the readers can't see it but it's a tamiya spitfire on top of a british roundel base and the basic idea here is when I put this on the table, it stands out because almost everything else is on the gear, which I appreciate, but I don't, I build them in flight. Some of the very early products before I was really involved in the business were bases like this that Bill and West did. So, I mean, this is a, a round L base painted. It just sets it off. And that's basically what my whole display is here. So again, we're always looking for ways to reinvest in the business. How do we make those? We looked at different materials. The base isn't made of cherry. It's made of a different type. It needs to sand well. It needs to take a good finish. And then it needs to take the paint and then the poly on top of it. How can we knock those out and make that a one day or two day production time as opposed to taking a week? Right. It's really great because, you know, it, it you're, you're reaching so many different subject levels in the hobby and you're doing from, I mean, you're talking about ships, you're talking about sci-fi, you're talking, I've seen your, I have your figure bases, I have some of your bigger bases and they're fantastic as, as it, everybody knows. But this, this expansion into the bigger style like this with the plexiglass is so, it's very intriguing to me and it's very, very, it's actually very exciting to see where you guys go with this. I have a feeling this this little, you know, world headquarters might be changing a little bit in the future. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. And and like Christian said too, where you know, where where we're putting these these large cases up on the website per subject and and people then can search them easily and find something like that. The the Titanic case was kind of our first big one where we had a number of people order, but then again it was Lego Titanic guys calling and and wanting. So we're more and 
more doing cases, not necessarily for modelers, but we're doing it for subjects, for, for, for something that people want cases at. Like right now, I'm doing a, a case for, it's, it's a real narrow one. It's only seven inches wide, 18 tall and 40 some inches long with lights in it. And it's going to be for a young boy. I think it's in California. His father has a an antique blunderbuss oh, that's wow. going to be sitting in there and then propped up and he's going to put it over his, it's going to be on his headboard or whatever. Wow. I mean, and, and we were, you were talking about what, what's the weirdest thing we did. Well, we, we made a astro case for a pet lizard that had died and they take it, they took it somewhere and they must, I don't know, somehow burn it down to just the skeleton. And oh. so the skeleton, the skeleton <laughs> of Sleazy, the pet, is, <laughs> is in, in this case or whatever his name was. So uh, that's that's wonderful. That's, that's, We're, uh, you know, I, you know, there, there's plenty of modelers out there and there's plenty of cases to be made for them and bases and everything else. But I think more so we, we've, we've got to uh, appeal to, to to just about everybody. Right. And we and we want uh, and we want to make it clear to anybody, you know, anybody listening and anybody around the world that we can put a case around just about anything. It doesn't yeah. even have to be yeah. a model. It can be right. a, a priceless heirloom in your family or a yeah. football or anything. You know, if you don't see it on our website directly, mm-hmm. give us a call because we make custom things all the time. Yeah. And yeah. we would love the opportunity to make something custom. And I could see it really good for like military relics, uh, mm-hmm. for helmets and stuff foreign arms, like you're talking about, you know, the guns and stuff like that. That's, that's fantastic. Well, I've yeah. taken up way too much of your time. Oh, okay. <laughs> so let me move <laughs> over to Doug and Doug's got a couple of questions for you himself. Sure. Sure. Well, my questions were going to be kind of along the line of what you've been talking about. Other que- we know, we know you, you market to modelers and now we know Lego people and mm-hmm. Uh, other kinds of maybe collectors. How do you do that? How do you go about marketing outside of model shows and things like that? And who do you look? Who do you look to mo- to market to? Yeah, it's it's been a little more difficult now that we don't go to as many local shows. Uh, we used to go to quite a few local shows and get get feedback from from people. And now all we really can do uh, to get out of the basement for a while is, is go to nationals. Yeah, that that's the one thing I wish we could we could get more feedback from from people that we should be doing more sci-fi. We should be doing more auto, which we are. We're do, we, we've got we've got auto uh, theme bases. But yeah, it, I, I just wish. You know, there was there was a way either through the website or people just, you know, on Facebook some, sometimes too, where they, they give us a suggestion of something to do. And of course, we post most I, I try to post once a month on Facebook, just pictures of what we've been doing or what we've been up to and, and uh, you know, possibly where we might be uh, going for, uh, you know, especially for nationals. A lot of times too, guys, uh, for nationals, that's that's the other thing. People are, you know, uh, shipping costs are a great deal for it. I remember when we went went to uh when we went to Omaha we must have took I don't know, seven, eight, nine things that we, you know, people ordered and then we delivered them, uh, you know, in person at nationals. So that's something too, where we're going to try to talk, you know, you know, we're doing a nationals here in, in Wisconsin in 2024. It would be easy for us to, to deliver, hand deliver if somebody's going to a, a nationals, you know, or, or if they're nearby, we could figure out a way to get it to them. But uh, in, in terms of, in terms of us getting out there in the world, it was primarily through shows, through our Facebook site, the website. But another thing that's been huge for us is just word of mouth from modelers or opportunities like this podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things for us that we take very, very pride in is we don't get a lot of complaints. Now, either people just aren't complaining or they are ecstatic with the product. There's it's, it's either one of those two things. And, and we hope it's the, and we hope it's the, the product is excellent. You know, we, we, we try to go when we go to great lengths to make sure that the product that you're getting is exactly as described exactly as you imagined. And it's to the highest basis by bill quality. But we, we do know that modelers talk to other modelers just, just for simple building and painting techniques, but also, you know, a modeler will bring a display case or an award or a base to his local meeting and say, Hey guys, I won this, or I've got this new base or I got this new case. And all of a sudden that sparks 
a conversation with somebody else. Well, that's pretty cool. Where'd you get it from? Well, we got it from Basis by Bill. Here's their information. And and a lot of a lot of uh, modeler to model re- referrals have have occurred. Um, yeah. and, and people but listening I, and watching this podcast too. Well, I think the other thing is really, you know, we don't have quote policies that we stand be- behind. I mean, if you buy something from us, yeah, you got to pay us. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> yeah, right. it's not a charity, <laughs> right. but if you don't like what you got from us, call us and we'll take care of it one way or the other. We either will make you, we'll fix it. We'll make something new or we'll, we'll refund your money. We're not in, we're not in this to, to screw people, you know, because they get a substandard product, you know, in terms of marketing, really where my role is, is with, with the basis of of the digital marketing is just really trying to make sure that when people are out there doing their Google search, because that's how you find something, is that we're showing up in some capacity, right? Our Facebook presence is our Facebook presence. You know, we we do interact with the different groups. We have branched into podcast sponsoring, as you know, proud to be a sponsor of this group. And, and as, as you know, two of your other colleagues, all of which have been a great relationship. And we have seen real examples of that helping us with the word of mouth. Our presence on Scalemates helps as well. We get a tremendous amount of inbound traffic. It doesn't necessarily convert immediately to a purchase because some of this stuff is, if I buy a one two hundred Titanic model to do, I'm probably not thinking about the case for a year or so. So we get a lot of people asking us questions. What would it be? What would the shipping cost be to the UK? It's not cheap, right? And the UK doesn't really, sorry, I've been the, the UK with the VAT doesn't really help us with items less than $100 in value because there's all this paperwork and stuff. So it makes that tough because there's a big audience there, but we sell into Australia as well. And I think another thing that's really helped us in terms of awareness is our whole awards business, which we really have only just touched on. This started, I think, primarily with doing awards for the Mad City Modelers. But then as people saw them and were looking for something different or more custom or more detailed or less expensive than going to the award shop, a local award shop and getting some things there, this has really led to a big portion of our business is doing those those awards. We call them custom because, you know, if you've got 22 different categories and you have a one, two, three, and you have a best of and you have best of show and things like that, we can do a variety of things. And once you get Weston working on that, then you end up with lighted awards done lighted that you awards. saw We've out at Las Vegas. They've yeah. done some crazy things. So, you know, the award business is important to us. And this is another area we're going to make investments so that we can do things because, you know, eventually clubs are going to want to see some variation and some different uh, ways of doing stuff. Now we've made it possible that we can individualize each of the awards in our production process. That's made it really easy. We can, we do sometimes where we cut out shapes. Um, I think our awards for Mad City, the best ofs are in the shape of the state of Wisconsin. We've done other ones, uh, various shapes, but the fact that we have the laser capability and other capabilities means that we can do a lot of things. We can do them in a timely basis and we can do them in a economical basis as well. So that's really been, that's been a growth area over the last couple of years as well, because that that's a situation where people see the award, they see it on Facebook, somebody posted it, someone brought it to their local club, someone talked about it at some level in the IPMS. And the next thing you know, Bill's getting a call saying, hey, we got a show in October, you know, can you can you do awards? Yeah, to, to Christian, to your point a little bit, I've got some of the... Uh... Yeah, for our listeners who can't see, they're showing a really nice award. I, I think it's gorgeous. I love I love the uh, the crisp wood and then the really nice uh, etching on it from the laser. I, I think it's perfect. It looks awesome. We I think we got a lot of this is the first time we've done it at, at our uh, contest here in in March, where by each of these awards, first, second, and third, they're they're individual awards. They're you know first place Allied Soft Skin Armor, nineteen forty five or whatever. As opposed to a coin that just says first place, second place, third place on it. It's fine. You know, you, 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 your, your club's got budget, but we found that 
so many of the people, you know, that came to the contest, they won something, they, they put their model out there and then they put their award there because the award tells you exactly what you won it for. It, it, it's, it's giving it more meaning as opposed to getting a coin or, or metal that's generic, may not even have the club logo on it. You may not even know what place it's for. Now with these awards, you have the opportunity to know exactly what you won, when you won it, why you won it, and put it next to your model. And the whole world knows what it was and why. And it gives it significant meaning. And you can hang it on your wall. You can put it in your display case. You can put it next to your model. However you want to display it is, is up to you. But the whole purpose of it is we want to give it meaning. We want it to be memorable so that you can remember that day. Wow, I, I went to Mad City Modelers or or another contest and I won five, five, six awards. And, and here's what I want it for. And you relive that day through the award, through your model, through your experience. You know, that's, that's the whole purpose of it. We don't like generic awards. We want it to be special because winning an award at any show at any level is special. Without a doubt. I, I just know the first time I saw anything from you guys was at the Vegas show, the nationals. And first I was, we were at our little table and people were walking by saying, have you seen the bases yet? Have you seen the guy with the bases over there? And, <laughs> and, and not only were they blown away by the quality of what they were seeing, but the, also the price of what they were seeing. Mm -hmm. it, it was, it, there was nothing unreasonable in your pricing at all. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. some, in some cases I have something here that I, I thought I was getting for a steal. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty amazing. So <laughs> I'm going to pass this on to Jensen. He's got some things to ask you. Indeed, I do. So obviously, one of the things you've, you've spoken about is there's kind of no limit to things you can create bases for or display cases for, mm -hmm. uh, which is awesome. It means literally, if I want something to look pretty, I can just contact you guys. <laughs> one thing I want to know is what is the most unique or obscure thing you've been asked to create a base for or display case for? There was a gentleman out in California that wanted me to make a, a pedestal, literally an altar for a case for a Titanic. And then he had artifacts that he was going to put in cubby holes around this altar really is what it was. And I, I, I turned the project down. I mean, he was willing to pay me whatever I wanted, but I thought, boy, I don't, I don't know, you know, going from just simple bases and awards to making some sort of altar. Right. <laughs> I thought that, that was, that was kind of weird. What other ones there were, uh, Oh, there was a, uh, a Department of Natural Resources that wanted me to make a huge counter for them for for one of their uh, for one of where they sell licenses and 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 uh, at, at one of their one of their big buildings. And I turned that down, too. I, I think it was beyond our etcher at that time. I don't think anything the things that they wanted, the backlighting on some things we we, we couldn't accomplish that. The other thing we've done is during the pandemic, we've put up a plexiglass barrier in right. in we, we did that at two post offices <laughs> here. In Wisconsin, we, we we did the one here in Waterloo and the one in uh, was it Ca Cottage Grove or Cambridge? Anyway, uh, what other weird things have we done? Well, there was the big cases we made. Was it for sailing ship models? They weren't like modeler modelers, but they were something. The guy out of Florida, right? Those oh, he cases. he was a uh, an antique dealer. Yeah, and we made a case for him that was ninety six inches by. I can't remember. It was 30 something tall and about 15 wide. It was a monster. And that one had to be shipped by freight. It got to the point where he, you know, he was concerned about it traveling. You know, I don't have a box. I don't, I, I don't know that UPS will take something like that. He had a company come from Milwaukee that came and picked up all the parts. I had them all laid out, all wrapped. They took it, took it back to their place and then put it, palletized it, put it, packed it all up and then shipped it to Florida. I'm sure that cost a hell of a lot of money. Yeah, we he wanted some really massive things, but we just couldn't get him there safely. We we made a huge table for him and I know that got there damaged. 
he would have ordered a lot more. But yeah, there's, yeah, believe it or not, there's guys out there that want just these tremendous pieces of furniture. But boy, how are we gonna, how are we gonna get it there to you? You know. Well, we do do some essentially furniture. We've got you go right. to the site, you'll see we have this um, sort of an end table, if you will, if you've got a bunch of the larger cases, and one will fit underneath, and then it's designed for one to sit on top. And the idea there is you built the HMS Rodney, and you built the Bismarck and you want to display them in your office, you know, where you actually work, well, this makes it a, a very nice piece of furniture. So yeah, know, we, the, skill, we just, the skill is there. We just had a customer that he ordered one of these big tables with a bottom shelf and we made a Bismarck case for him with lights and he's putting the Bismarck below and the Titanic, one, one, he's building the Titanic now and is going to order the case when he finishes it. Uh, you know, these cases are, I think the overall outside length, they're, they're over 63 inches long. So a lot of, you know, you don't have a table that big. You don't have an area. You know, a couple of guys put them on their mantle. Uh, we, mm-hmm. we narrow them a little bit and they can get them on their mantle. And we've done that a number of times. But yeah, you need a place to put the, the ship or whatever. We'll make a, a really nice, simple to put together table. And that table too, Christian, where we, where we have it on there, we have a long, narrow table. Well, we could, you know, we can make a, you know, four foot by four foot table if you wanted to put some huge diorama on it you, you or, or uh, whatever. So there's a, you know, and we can, I've built some where I've made a table and I've made the case right into the table, uh, display case with lights. Don't so, we have a uh, customer that scratch built a 130 stuck in B-17? It was, it was 45 by like 36. And yeah, that, that's a huge piece of plexi, you know, flat on top. And he's, he, yeah, he built a big sub, a big U-boat. We made a nice case for him. And then uh, another case for him and he had three subs or something in it. Yeah. And that one, talk about weird. Weston was able to find, it's basically like a, a disco light, but you can slow it down and put different colors in it. And it makes it look like it's underwater. So we, we mounted these two, well, they're, like I say, disco balls are probably four inches round on, on the top of of this huge German U-boat turns the lights out and then you can turn this on and it's real slow. It really looks like it's underwater. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Well, uh, if you see, go to see the U-505 in Chicago at the museum there. Yeah. They, they remade that years ago. And when you first walk in, they have that sort of lighting effect where the light's mm-hmm. coming through the water. It was exactly the same. It was <laughs> really cool. I mean, yeah, there were, there's a lot of one-off projects. I mean, over, over six years, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's hard to remember them all, but a lot of stuff where a, a relative had died and they, they wanted to make a, a B-25 or, or the ship they were on or, or the ship. One guy, we did a, a case for a gentleman out in California. California, he was on a destroyer during uh, during the Vietnam War, and I, I don't know that he was the commander, but he, he was an officer anyway on the ship, and he had won awards. So we make a case for him with a little drawer for him to put his awards in. Yeah, I, I, I want to break in real quick. You did a base for a friend of mine out here uh, before he he built a, the Tamayo 148 scale Phantom F4 Phantom for a gentleman mm-hmm. that flew the Phantom in mm-hmm. Vietnam on a carrier deck, and you put the awards and every, his awards and everything on this. It was a gentleman that had just recently passed away uh, mm-hmm. and the family adores the object. It did, like you say, though, mm-hmm. it's, it's staying with that family now forever. Mm-hmm. So yeah, one, I'll, I'll just tell you one, one other thing we made some awards for, uh, I, it might've been for Indiana IPMS uh, in Indiana. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it was for their main award that particular year. Their, their best of was in memory of, of a gentleman that had passed away from the club. I, I remember his last name was Os- Sika. They had it such that the, the widow came up and was part of the presentation of the award to to the person. And the the woman uh, thought that was the greatest thing was it was a big deal. And and truly that that's that that was just a cool thing to see that they were able to, uh, to you know to honor his memory. His wife was involved and and uh, she gave the award away and it was a good thing. That is something that we can do that we haven't really touched on. We can take a photo and we can make it possible to 
using a technique like you used to use on old news newspaper photos with the laser so we can put that some of our cases they have different orientations so they have a back to them like what we call the three-sided cases or the astral cases so if you had someone in the family and you had like their their service photo or whatever we can actually etch that into the background and then again that gives an additional connection you know and then you could the case can be big enough to have that f4 or it can have any number of things so the laser gives us a lot of capabilities to do something meaningful yeah and you know it's interesting you bring that up because i could even see that being applicable to modelers because some of us you know we have uh we have an interest in replicating photographs and i think it would be amazing to have a plinth or a base that has the photo we're trying to replicate etched mm-hmm. into it. I've seen that done by one person in Europe, and I always thought that was the coolest idea. And knowing you have the capability to do it gives me a lot of ideas on like, oh man, I, I think this is an option in the future on how to convey mm-hmm. it as opposed to like putting a stupid little printout next to it. It's actually memorialized mm-hmm. in the base as well. And yep. uh, I think that's really cool. Yeah. We did a three sided base for a gentleman that did uh, a wingnut wings German aircraft. And then he had collected, what are they, what were they called, Bill? Yasta cards? Right. They were yeah, cards they were a printed, postcard. Yeah. Or, they were or a, a collector card from card the First or World War. I think we etched on the bottom, maybe some sort of unit insignia or something else. But in the back, we put a little holder, a little brass holder, so he could put these different postcards in there. Oh, cool. Yeah, he had his wingnut wings, which, you know, those are those are valuable aircraft now and a lot of work in this lighted three case so that he could show that. So, you know, again, the thing that I'd really like listeners to come away with is if you have ideas or things that you want to do, don't feel when you look at the website, basesbybill.com, by the way, we hadn't mentioned that, <laughs> <laughs> that if you don't see that, that doesn't mean that we don't do it, right? Because we can't show you everything that's possible in the universe. That, then that's all we would be doing is coming up with, you know, different things. We can't show you, we can't show you every, you know, unit that we can do out of this book. This is just for the fleet air arm, squadrons of the fleet air arm. This is a reference that we have, which starts as the beginning of these emblems. If we did just that, we'd still be working on it years later. So that's why if people are doing different things and, you know, we, we do watch the kit releases and try to come up with stuff. You know, for example, we've got a case listed for that giant German uh, rail piece of artillery. The Dora, yeah, I saw scale. That. The Dora. We may never sell one of those, but if we don't put that out there, then people don't know that there's a chance that we have that. In terms of the other emblems and things like that, we've got quite a few, and those are very popular. I, you know, we've talked a lot about the plexiglass display cases and what we call the Astro case. Case, which is the, the bent case. We should probably talk, Bill, a little bit about the evolution mm-hmm. of the thinking sure. behind that. But, you know, just about, I mean, without giving away trade secrets, we sell a lot of bases. They're, they're inexpensive. They're a great addition to a model. We can make them quickly and they're very popular. And even today I was doing some work for a particular base where it's going to be just a, a, a standard base, but it's going to have the 503rd, 503rd or the 502nd, that Tiger tank that we were talking about. It's going to have a label on there and it's going to have the mammoth uh, insignia on it. And those things, people just love that because now it's a, a base that's tied to that. And so, yeah, Weston's showing the different <laughs> orientations of what we call the Astro case because we've got to come up with a name for it. So I came up with the name Astro case and the boys said, okay, well, it's, that's better than the mega case or whatever. So, But there's actually a story behind this and a lot of engineering that went into it. Yeah, yeah. so the story behind it was the one day I was perusing YouTube, as, I, as, I, as <laughs> most of us do, and I came across a gentleman that he had a video on bending plexiglass. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's interesting. How, how, do you, how do you bend plexiglass and he showed the process of it the type of equipment you need and it's like well i can do that if he can do it i can do it so 
we set about the getting the equipment to to bend the plexiglass. We started bending it, and we're like, "This is cool. This is this is this is this is unique." We're able to bend plexiglass now, and I was kind of struggling. I'm like, "What can I do with this? I can do something with it, but I got to figure out what." One of the things with the five sided cases is they do take a little bit of time to manufacture, just simply because most of the time they're custom. I mean, anytime you do custom manufacturing of anything, it takes time. And for some people, they can't wait that long, or in other cases where the object or the heirloom or the model that they're displaying is too small or is really small, it may not make economical sense or time duration sense to wait for a five-sided case. So the idea came about, well, if I can bend plexiglass, how can I turn it into a display case? And the idea kind of came around, well, I've got a CNC, I got a CNC machine. I can bend this plexiglass put the two together with two wood end caps, put some, put the plexi in the middle and lo and behold, there's your display case. Well, this display case idea, I wanted it to be kind of universal in its base configuration that you can display it vertically on a ta- on a desk or table or horizontally uh, for like a ship model or a diorama or tank or airplane, however you want it displayed. But then also to be able to display it on your wall you know, hang it on your wall. All of our Astro cases have the ability to have keyholes in the back of them. So you can hang it on the wall, both in the vertical or in a semi-horizontal orientation where you don't necessarily have a wood piece underneath it, but you've got some plexi underneath it. So if you had an airplane or something you wanted to see underneath, you could still be able to see it. I've also come up with ideas for a two-sided case, and that would be kind of the next iteration of this. If someone wanted to have a wood bottom, but also display it horizontally on your wall, we could do so. I haven't made one yet, but I'm very, very confident I could do it. But this case, it's kind of a jack of all trades. Yes, you're not getting visibility on the end caps. You know, a lot of people like the bubble style cases where you're able to see it on all five sides, where the plexiglass is very minimal and it's it's just the model, the model's center of attention. Uh, But again, like all of our products, you know, we're making... You know, we're making frames for the Mona Lisa, you know, that kind of analogy. This case, you know, you're removing some framework, but the quality is absolutely excellent. And the other thing is just how flexible it is in its base configuration to display. And you combine that with the ability to put lights in there. As we have, you can do lights in the vertical orientation, horizontal orientation, it's a, it's a big deal. You know, we sell them for a lot of the smaller models, you know, smaller display cases, you know, the more economical choice for the smaller stuff. We've put rotators in them before, but we really don't want to advertise those until we revisit them again. It's, it's, it's an excellent case for the smaller stuff. Um, something where you don't want to have as much framework. These cases are excellent for uh, another feature on our display cases moving forward. Uh, this is kind of a big thing for us. Instead of having the inline dimmer switches that we typically provide with our display cases, eventually we're going to start rolling it out here very shortly. But all of our display cases, if you order them with a light package, uh, they will automatically come with a remote control. I was able to secure a really nice remote control. And this remote control is the real deal. It's not a something you have to point at even. You can be well across your house or well across the, the room at Nationals and activate these lights and turn them on, dim them, get them to flash, get them to do some crazy thing. So new display cases moving forward. Uh, we're looking to integrate the, the remote control into them. Uh, for existing customers, if you have a display case from us and you want a remote control, we have an option for that as well uh, that will be coming available in the near to immediate intermediate future. Ultimately, yeah, these the Astro cases were kind of just a, an amalgamation of bending plexiglass and seeing, seeing the slots out and incorporating light packages like we do on our five-sided cases. So The other thing we did with the Astro cases is instead of saying, well, here's the Astro case design, let us know what size you want. We determined that we were going to make some standard sizes. On the website, they're both the horizontal and then there's the vertical because there's some different things you do with the lighting in terms of where it goes. But that made it possible then for us to work ahead a little bit because we can see and see the end pieces and the bottom pieces. Not a huge amount, but you can also take a bunch of them to a show and you know that you're going to have a good opportunity to move those you know, at nationals, I guess I should say. The other thing that we've tried to do is we've, you know, the the whole business of getting 
things ship to people is pretty complicated. And that's usually the first question on anything is how much is this going to cost me? So what we do on a number of our products is we've incorporated shipping in the 48 lower U.S. states into the price. And this also extends to probably our, our most basic product. And this is an innovation we did last year. Yeah, last year, 2022, mm -hmm. is the basic base where it can be any dimension from two to two to 30 by 30. Beautiful finished cherry, and it can be laser engraved with whatever you want. And it's it's really meant to be an alternative alternative to going to the craft store and getting a picture frame or trying to monkey with that. It's meant to be inexpensive. It's meant to be really easy for us to produce and finish and get that out the door to someone quickly. So that's, again, one of the innovations is we're trying to make it easier for the customer to get our products. In some cases, though, with the larger cases, we just can't. We, we have to price it out on the basis of you know what it's going to cost. I mean, if you want a ship for your rod, if you want a ship case for the Rodney and you're in Albania, true story, it's going to cost more to ship it there through the best means that we have available to us than it is for you to actually buy the case. I mean, that's, that's just the way it goes. Again, with the, with the Astro case, while we have the standard sizes, we do make them custom then because people can see them and say, well, I want to, I want to move the F4 and I want to display it in an angle, which we always recommend because that that's like one of the basics of displaying something on the base is don't have it oriented parallel, have it linear, have a little angle there. Well, if you need an extra two inches of headroom, we can do that. There's a limit to how much we can bend with plexiglass, but I think we've got that pretty much down that we we have we don't have a lot of rejections, even though we kind of made the bender to meet the to meet the need. But we've got a nice smooth radius there. It's it's a really attractive looking case. And it helps us address that audience of figures, right? As well as uh, real space, rockets and stuff. You know, you have an orient vertical orientation for it, mount on the wall, lighting, that sort of thing. And then also for figure people, is, as you mentioned earlier, we have very simple little block base. And again, those also last year, we innovated and made those custom, made to order. So if you need three by three by three or six by four by 10 or whatever it is you need, you just need a block of wood with uh, maybe a Falcon Schmieger insignia laser and in, engraved on the front of it. You just order it right up. And again, that's another one of those where the price includes the ship. So we're, we're not trying to be all things to all people, but we're trying to encompass really the variety and creativity that exists in our scale modeling hobby. That's awesome. I know Jensen uh, has one of your little plinths for a figure. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, just a funny story. I think you all probably see uh, countless modelers that show up at a show, buy something, and then it immediately appears on the contest table. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was the one contest where he had a blimp? Yeah, yeah. I can't remember where that was at. That might have been Vegas where he, uh, yeah, he bought a, I don't know what baseboard we had it. And then he had to put this blimp up on blocks or whatever. So he bought, I don't know what he all bought to get this thing was. sitting up, but yeah, he quick took yeah. it out on the table and, and cobbled it together and got this blimp airborne. And we always, we um, always bring the drill and yeah. <laughs> drill driver set for these shows because you never know when someone needs to pull a hole. Oh, and that one there. guy, I remember a guy uh, at Chattanooga, he had a, a, a one 700 scale Japanese, it might've been a destroyer. It was tiny and he wanted, well, can you mount it to a, to a thing there? And I'm thinking, brother, I ain't, I'm not touching this thing <laughs> so we're we're goofing around with it and and we i don't know how we got it in place but i, I honestly i was sweating because it was it was a really nice you could tell it was a beauty it was it, it was probably going to place you know and and i thought man i i, yeah, I don't want to be drilling holes in this thing you know so that uh, that's a funny story because i actually drove to the show with that guy that's bill dedig from pittsburgh oh was it bill <laughs> that was one of the first oh, yeah. moments we know bill yeah i remember oh, no. Uh, I remember him <laughs> picking the, uh, you know, the rising sun flag for the Japanese. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, I remember him carrying a drill or something <laughs> through the vendor room. And he's like, I got this base and these mounts. And uh, he was, yeah, he was going out. I was oh, like, no, oh no kidding. Gosh, that was no. Bill. I don't, oh God. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, we just did awards for their contest. I think uh, 
Yeah, I think Tricon. it was last week, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, they they're great guys. Uh, and I, I love <laughs> Bill. That that's awesome that you provide w- awards for them. Good folks. That's a funny story because I, I think that's the first introduction <laughs> I had to your team. So very cool. <laughs> well, really and cool. another thing we do, being small business people, there is no such thing as scrap wood, right? <laughs> so what we do is we take any any of this wood that is that would normally be scrap, and we finish it off. Off and give it a nice finish, particularly this cherry. And we'll take it to nationals just exactly for that thing. And we'll just have it. Here's a box. I forget yeah. what we sell them for. Is it five bucks? Well, they're five Something bucks like a piece that. for small, small five stuff. bucks a piece for small stuff. And that way, then, you know, you, 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 if you think about the time and effort it would take to get something like that or to make it yourself or whatever, it's, it's a no brainer. It's an impulse purchase. It's good for everybody because we're not wasting product. You're getting something that you can place underneath your model and off you go. Because, you know, if you're doing 70 second scale armor, you probably need something under there. You're going to lose it in the carpet. Well, gents, we have been going on for about 90 minutes. You know, we've covered so much. It's been such a great story. We want to thank you all for joining us. And and maybe as kind of a last sign off, Kristen, I'll turn it over to you. Tell tell our folks again where uh, where they can find your work, uh, where they can buy your product, and what shows maybe to expect you all at. Yeah, so the the first place to start is our website, which is basesbybill.com. And you can get a, a listing of our current available products there and also a way to contact us and ask questions and share ideas. And we really love and encourage you to say, hey, can you do this? If you've got a picture of something or something you've seen at a show or whatever, let us know. We also have a strong Facebook page and it's Bases by Bill on Facebook. So you can find us there. For this year, you'll see us at San Marcos. Pretty much at this point are limiting ourselves to the national events, primarily because we have a lot of work to do. And that's time away from the world headquarters producing product. So we're kind of dialed in on that right now. There may be opportunities for us to go to the regional shows, but we'll, we'll be at San Marcos. And of course, we'll be at uh, Madison in 2024 because that's our, our home our home show. And we're, we're very excited as a club to be the, the host and really hope everybody can come to Madison in 2024. I think you really enjoy it. It's a great area of the country. It's a great venue that we have, a great facility, a lot of hotels, a um, lot of things to do in Madison. So we hope to see you there. Awesome. Thanks so much. And Bill and Wes, any parting shots for our listeners? Thank you so much for joining us. Well, one of, thanks for having us. We we appreciate just talking with people and getting ideas. You know, we could we could spend all day. Honestly, I I, I just love to hear. Just contact us with 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 an idea that you have or something that you may come up with. You don't necessarily even have to buy something. Just give us some ideas what you what you'd like to see more of. The the things that we're going to have new for uh, San Marcos will be uh, we're making uh, the bases for the the turret model. We have one for the Yamato, the Bruno, and the, oh, nice. the Iowa class. The but I other have a Bruno <laughs> turret, so I'm interested. Yeah, so no, I have a Bruno <laughs> turret also, so I'm interested. Yeah, yeah this so is basically what we're talking this is about the, for the listeners is the 170 second scale. Oh, take yeah, them. oh, I love uh, it. Oh, lies are nice. Bill is showing a, a, a box with the Bruno and the, uh, I think it's the Edelweiss uh, or whatever the uh, Bismarck mm-hmm. insignia That's the was. That's the for the Bismarck. It, mm-hmm. The crest for the Bismarck. We've done it for the Yamato, which has got a series of turrets. We'll be doing it for the other. That'll be on the website. Awesome. But this, this thing, you can detach the top, of course, when you're working on the model or attaching it or whatever, and then put it back on there. Oh, um, very cool. So turret bases is a new thing. The other thing is a lot of times people are asking just about simple nameplates for things. So I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'll make a couple nameplates. So I honestly, I've got between a thousand and 1500, just simple nameplates for ships, for armor, for uh Mandalorian, for, uh, Love it. for the, you know, the one 16 scale armor. So there'll, there'll be all kinds of new ones like that. We have just regular simple bases. There'll be a ton of uh, figure bases. I've got a whole bunch of them because boy, we sold a lot of those in, in Omaha. We, we sold almost sold out on them. And then uh, I've, I've made a, uh, a case strictly for the 116 scale Sherman. So I've, I've, I'll have one or two examples of that. I think we're going to have another, we, we call it a Quonset hut 
case where it's literally oval, oval cover. Hopefully I, I've had, I've got the makings for two of them in the basement and I really need to, to get done with, get, get those two done and have them available. We're trying to to catch up from where we were at Omaha and and offer a lot of these new things, uh, you know, from people stopping at the table and telling us what they might like. Well, thank you, gentlemen, so much for joining us. I'm certainly <laughs> excited to order some bases. I, uh, you've given me a lot of ideas, and I, I'm sure uh, I'm sure the Plastic Posse will be partaking in your website very soon. And you might have a truckload just for us to take home at Nats because I can see uh, the Tiger, the you know the Sherman, especially the uh, the turrets as well. These are all super unique things, and we just love your product. I know we all have them, and uh, can't wait to buy more. So thank you so much, Wes, Bill, awesome. Christian, yeah. for your time. Uh, this was awesome, and uh, uh, we'll be in touch. So thank you, gentlemen. Very good. Yeah. Thanks for having thank us. You. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks. Just like to express my appreciation for all the work you do to put the podcast together because yeah, uh, no kidding. I know it's a lot of work to get everybody together and then what Scott needs to do. And so, you know, keep it going. It's part of my weekly routine. <laughs> thanks so much. Well, hopefully you listen to our uh, April Fool's episode that just released <laughs> with our good friend Jethro Billings. Uh, we're just trying to have a little fun. Uh, but yeah, and a lot of that's due to Scott. It's unfortunate he couldn't join us for this segment. Uh, but I know he definitely appreciates those words. So thank you, All gentlemen, right. so much. All right. Very thank good. You. Thank cool. you. Bye. All right. That was a really great interview. I'm sorry I missed that. Wasn't feeling too great, but you guys did a, a great job. It was just, it was awesome to hear those guys talk about how much passion they pour into their product and how seriously they take quality. I learned, I learned a lot, you know, and it really kind of made me respect what they do, you know, even more so. So yeah, just anybody that needs a base, those guys are the way to go. Yeah, no doubt. Those guys, speaking to those guys, you can see just how much they they love what they do. And and in seeing that, it just made us all spend a lot more money. Yeah, I just add, I think I think they've really made an impact in the hobby. I think that, you know, their product is is in, in incredibly differentiated from anything else that you see it shows. It's so unique. It's such a high quality and they're just genuine people. So if you see bases by Bill either online or at a show, check out their products. I'm, I'm certainly going to make a laundry list of things to get from them. It's nice that they'll actually bring some of their larger items to Nats. So if you're contemplating that large display case for you know a Titanic or the Missouri or the Yamato, I, I'm looking at one for the Tiger One that I can use to kind of rotate my 116th builds for, through like reach out to them. They will bring it to Nats to help save you on shipping. And then you can, you know, pick it up there and, and, you know, minimize the risk of any damage from an outside source. So please check out Bases by Bill. Really thankful that they all stopped by. It was great to know their story. And I look forward to seeing them in Texas. Yeah, I think um, I think one of the most interesting things is, I mean, they kind of just like accidentally fell into it. It was not like build and set out to like, I'm going to make these awesome bases and sell them to everybody. He just made a couple of bases and they're like, Oh, we could, we could like do this. Right. Like, Oh, sure. Why not? Let's give it a try. And, uh, I guess like stumbling into success almost like, uh, I mean, not, not, not to belittle him and say he was stumbling, but like, yeah, just didn't set out to do any, you know, to become what he is and, and, and just did it. And, um, I've said to me because the product's the product does it for him. It, they're amazing. I got a whole bunch myself. Bef this was before, you know, when we first met him. And I'm like, man, this is really good stuff for amazing prices. There's no reason not to just load up on it. It's yeah. always a good recipe for success when your success is driven by innovation to make your product better. You know, I worked on uh, worked on a project with them for uh, Mr. Everett as a Christmas gift for him. And uh, I'm telling you, if you guys need anything, they're so easy to work with. And what I got was three times better than what I thought I was going to get. I think John was pretty thrilled with it. I mean, just you, you just love doing business with those kind of people. And for the craftsmanship that goes into it there, you know, we've talked about needing to reverse negotiate almost with them. Their prices are ridiculous for what you get. I mean, you're you're always going to get more than you pay for. Always, always. I like the fact that the funny thing to me was a story about how they would have to go into their local Ace Hardware and get the plexiglass cut. And it's like when they walk in, it's like, oh, there here it comes from. We need to cut some plexiglass, you know. And it just shows, you know, you know, they're helping out their local community too. They're getting you know stuff done locally, and it's good, and it's it's really nice. 
If you would like to rep the posse, you can check out our merch page. The location of that will be in our episode notes. And it's also on our Facebook. Uh, Many of you have already ordered uh, coffee mugs, t-shirts, jumpers, of course, our official Triple P lounge trousers. JB, I think we've had some pretty good suggestions lately. We may need to create some new products. Yeah, with our special seventh host, we might need to create a special uh, Jethro section. So certainly. Uh, lots of lots of demand for Jethro Billy <laughs> merch, but yep, you can a, again. You can order all of your stylish plastic posse merch on the web um, at the address that'll be in the show notes. Um, you know, we'll just be completely transparent. We're not making almost anything on this. We try to keep our prices low. We just appreciate you guys. Uh, you know, kind of repping the posse. If we see you at a show and you're wearing any of this stuff, uh, we're gonna we're gonna hook you up with some swag as well. So anyway, check that out. Yeah. I just like to echo that, Scott. Not only if we see you at a show, if you do go to a show and rep Posse Swag, please take a picture of you at the show, you know, with the show in the background or with some other Posse members. We'd love to send you a little gift for doing that. We want to thank all of you for joining us for episode 68. Your support, along with our great sponsors and Posse Outriders, help bring the triple P to you every two weeks. Remember to send feedback on this episode to plasticpossepodcast at gmail.com. And if you haven't joined our Plastic Posse group on Facebook, head over there and join up. We have almost 4,000 members and the community continues to grow strong. See you in two weeks. And well, you know what they say. Yeehaw! Yeah, buddy. Yeah, look at you. <laughs> Not bad for a I mean, colonial. <laughs> I mean, I've not done that since the first time I did it. <laughs> you can give the little the little Howard yeah, the, fist pump. I, I, I live for the role. I become the character. <laughs> it's method acting. <laughs> If you would like to support the Triple P and become a Plastic Posse Outrider, go to our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Plastic Posse Podcast and set up a recurring donation there. This helps us offset the cost of bringing you the Triple P. There are three different tiers of support starting at just a buck a month. Let's recognize our amazing deputy marshals. Frank Perone, Dennis Tennant, the voice of Bob, Jeremy Diamond, Ryan Smith, Terry Wilkinson, Chris Lovewell, Andrew Callis, Ethan Idemill, Bruce the Model Noob, Steve Baker, Eric Daglish, Joe Porche, Graham Pearson, Patrick Brown, Steve Schaefer, Jay Kidd, Paul Burdett, Brandon Gentry, Robert Klein, Mark Ewing, Ted Kalahara, John Bryan, Scale Model Hanger, Toad Man, Model Doc, Doug Reed, Greg James, Les Wakala, B Colt 1911, John Everett, Josh Buck, Black Rifle, Model Works, Thomas Baniak, Mark Bradley, Zach Pease, Joel Munson, Eric Brubaker, Jeremy Moore, DB Scale Model Studio, Matt Johnston, Jeremy Elliott, Mike Talley, Previous Seat, Mediocre Middle-Aged Modeler, Dan Offel, and J.C. Osborne. Also, we'd love to give a shout out to our excellent posse foreman, George, G. Baker, Warhoff Models, Drew, Ross, Eric, Len, John, Cliff, Eric, Mike, Alex, Benjamin, Craig, Papa Steve, Logan, Red Beach One, MD Models, JV, Toby, Damian, Kieran, Cody, Papa Mike, Charlie, Tim, Nuke Man Mike, Greg, J.A.K. Jack, Ash, Irish Pat, Paul, What's the Deal with Eyebones Models, Mr. Grizz, Jackson, Mac Armor, Chris, Lee, Jamie and Jethro. And of course, for our posse outriders, including our newest member, Roger Newman. Thanks for joining, Roger. Really appreciate it. Also, we're asking you for a favor. Please consider posting a review of the Triple P on the podcast platform of your choosing or on Facebook. Each five-star review helps other modelers find the Plastic Posse. Also, if you haven't already, please join our Plastic Posse group on Facebook. It's a great place for you to have community interaction, post your build pics, ask questions, or just hang out with us. So until next time, thank you again for all of your support. We love you and hope to see you in person and online.
do want to talk about Legos. I don't know what triggered yeah. us, but this last either. week there was a uh, there was a little group a little group posting back and forth, and we all kind of reminisced, uh, you know, in our in our childhood of what Legos we had. Oh yes, yes, Jensen <laughs> has has converted to Legos. So <laughs> I don't build models anymore. <laughs> no, what it came from is the. Jackson, being a really tall child, he is. He started like <laughs> collecting all the. <laughs> He'll appreciate it. It's fine. Um, he, he started getting out all of his um, Star Wars Lego, and he was asking me he wants to collect the. Uh, this is where I know nothing about Star Wars. The orange clone troopers, the two twelfth. Uh, sure. He wants to, clone yeah, Wars them. isn't real Star Wars, so it doesn't matter. That's fine. But no, we'll, I'm just. We'll, we'll, we'll I always that. say that because it pisses him <laughs> off. Um, yeah, so he, he started collecting his army up and getting all these old Lego from when he was younger. And then we started getting these battle packs. Uh, well, sorry, him and Zach were doing a build. And then they said, do you want to join? And we get these battle packs and see what we can make of them and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, this is fun. And I was on Amazon. There was some like cheap Lego City sets. I was like, I used to love Lego City. That's like so much fun. It's like I'm a big kid again. Um, so I bought some of them, got the Star Wars stuff to build, and then we put it in chat. It kind of snowballed, and now everyone's like, into Lego, we've we've now changed the podcast into the Lego posse podcast. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I get um, my kids. We we have a tradition on Christmas Eve. We all get Legos and build Legos on Christmas Eve, and I I get a lot of Star Wars ones, and I always build them, then take the minifigures out and keep those in these little cases, and then just give the the little ships away to you know friends to their kids or whatever, and then. Lately, my wife's been buying the larger scale, like the like the trooper helmets. I like the troopers. That's that's my thing. I've got dozens and dozens of them, but I've got a Mando one from last Christmas. I didn't get it built and I need to finish the Mando helmet. And then JB uh, brought up some good childhood memories and we were having this discussion Man, when I was a kid, Lego castles with the little Lego knights. That that was my that was my jam. I loved you know the the horses and you put on the little jousting tournaments and anyway, yeah, great stuff. Yeah, I'm with you, Scott. I remember those Lego the night the night sections and you just could, they were huge. The the, the castle well, they're not huge. They were they were big. The castles and stuff like that. Not compared to what you're seeing today is which is is crazy. I the the Titanic you know, in Legos and the things that they're just, they're amazing. And I didn't know, I guess I, I've been out of Legos for a long time, but then I started looking at Legos online and there's people there that are just fanatical. I mean, really fanatical about, you know, they have their own rooms downstairs. Like we have our hobby rooms and they've got just all Legos they're building and stuff like that. And I actually found an app you can buy. And this is, I, I was going deep nerd on this one. And, um, you can take a, you can lay Legos out, a bunch of Legos on a, on a table, on a white background, take a picture of it, put it in this app, and Lego will tell you what exactly you can build with those Legos. So then they'll send you directions on a, how to build something with it. So it's kind of cool. You know, it's just, it's just, it's really neat to see how Lego and to see how Lego has advanced with technology and how they're mm -hmm. doing everything is really, really cool. Um, I'm so excited. <laughs> it's weird. Um, I heard somewhere this is a completely weird, random fact. Apparently, the number one tire producer on the planet is Lego. Accurate. Oh wow, which yep. is crazy. And it's wow. when I I had Lego like, when I was like really young. I always wanted it. It was fun. It was creative and that. And it cost quite a bit back then. And you look now, it's like yeah, it costs quite a lot now. But it's one of those. It's just. Oh, I think it's always going to hold its value because people will buy it because it's so much fun. Yeah, especially like people collect it as well. That oh has yeah, big collector value. Oh yeah, huge. Yeah, collector value. there's there's like a superstar destroyer kit, mm -hmm. and on eBay, if you've got one of those sealed, those things go for like three grand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The UCS stuff. Oh, I want the it's, ATAT, but it's, oh. where do I put it? Yeah, so so good. The um, you know, it's I, I I think part of this sparked a lot of my interest because my mom is moving out of the house I grew up in and I have all my Legos there and I'll be going back at the end of the month to kind of bring them back to uh, Denver because I, I mean, however old I'm getting, I'm always going to love Legos. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my wife's birthday is in July and, and she doesn't listen to the show, so I'm not going to spoil anything <laughs> in terms of getting her a gift. But I I think what I'm going to surprise her with is the Lord of the Rings Rivendell set. 
Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh, so oh, man. oh man. Where do so, I get on JB's Christmas list? Man? Oh gosh. So she showed some interest towards it because she's a huge um uh you know Tolkien and Lord of the Rings fan, Hobbit, all that. And uh she showed it and I was looking at it I'm like, this is pretty awesome. Yeah. I mean, this is amazing. So it's uh and it's really interesting because I love Lego because they've even their brand has evolved. So they're black boxes. I was in a Walmart yesterday picking up something. I was walking over to the sporting goods, but the toys were there in the aisle. I passed literally just yesterday um, had Legos and it wasn't just kids Legos. It was now I should take that back. All Legos are for everyone from, you know, they're they're zero to 99 scale or whatever for ages. <laughs> and they're kind of cheeky about that. But one of the things I admire is their black box sets. And it's kind of what we've hit at already that more professional Legos, I guess you could say, where they've done architecture, which I think those are freaking amazing yeah um one of the one i love the ones that they did <laughs> nice <laughs> i like uh i love the legos that they do now they did dagobah with a crashed x-wing and yeah. they're doing dioramas mm -hmm. but in lego form it's, it's seriously it's the same concept that we use for scale modeling mm -hmm. just in legos mm -hmm. and i think they're timeless i uh you know, I'm also a big fan of any Lego. I don't need sets. So growing up, my mom would mm -hmm. go to, you know, garage sales and flea markets and she would just buy bags of Legos for like a dollar and she'd just bring them home. And I have a giant, I'll take a picture of it when I go back. Uh, it's still in the basement where I left it 10, 15 years ago, but I, we had two pool tables growing up. One of them was a whole town. So I had an old wow. space monorail from the cool. 80s. I had the black and yellow train and I made the pool table into a town and then some streets. And then uh, I, I didn't have the nice castle. I had the mega blocks castle, but it's still, I could integrate Legos with it, but it was just like the big lots version. Um, <laughs> but I had like the space shuttle and stuff, but on the wall I had, honestly, it's just like my spares box for kits. I had my Legos color coordinated. So yellow pieces here, red pieces here, you know, people here, vegetation, like all of that was, you know, in these bins and drawers where if I wanted to create something, I, I could do it. I even remember like putting random pieces together. I made a Horton flying wing, a white oh, wow. one um, out of like white wings and then like a boat hull and, you know, just put landing gears on the tips of the wings. And I, it's just, I don't know, it, it's, it's probably the impetus of scale modeling. It's, and it's something that you can always have in parallel with it. I, I freaking love Legos. It's, I'm disappointed TJ had to drop out because of internet issues, because I know he has that passion too. And I know he has a lot of his Lego sets too. And he had some of the really wacky space ones mm. that were like super neon colored glass on mm. them. And, oh, just freaking awesome. I can't actually wait to get mine. And I might set them up in the basement here. Mm. I, I don't know. You know, it's, it's something that's, I don't, they're just timeless and they bring you yeah. joy. And, and there's been sets to this day. Like I want to be like Jensen. I just want to buy them and build them because they're freaking <laughs> awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, Jackson and I were talking about the, one of the first sets we ever had. It was a police station, Lego city police station. And it came with a weird vacuum form, weird shaped base. Oh yeah. 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 And we were thinking, I was like, Oh, we should both try and get that set. I mean, it'll be expensive now. Um, and try and build it. But I'm sure we can get, you can, the good thing about the Lego website, you can get the instructions, even yeah. from like sets from like 30 years ago. It's right. amazing. Just try and build it. Cause why not? Yeah. We've got all the parts. Like I, don't, I never get rid of Lego. Like, no, never. never. Um, so definitely still got all the pieces for it. Yeah. It's, yeah. I think is it the is it the one the vacuum form where it's like the ramp up and there's mm -hmm. a That's platform the one. on top? Yeah. It's like the most, the most vertical ramp ever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they did a little castle on it too. That's the one I have. Oh, yeah. look yeah, at that! That's, that's what they're doing nowadays. So our listeners, like what's, yeah, what Scott's showing us is a bust of uh, Mando's helmet, and that gets more to like, dare I say, it's socially at least in my house and my friends or people I could visit. It is socially acceptable to oh, build God, yeah. that type of le Lego and put it on your bookshelf, put it oh, in yeah. your yeah. office, yeah. show it in a public space. Like, Oh, please. it's, it's getting displayed. I have a, <laughs> I have a Grogu and a, and a stormtrooper in that same series. And yeah, they're out for sure. Yeah. 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 I've got people at work that I work with engineers, you know, 
you know, several, you know, one guy's got two doctorates and he's got Lego, the, the black box sets on his desk, you yeah. know, and he shows them. Out. I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's fun, phenomenal. The black box, yeah. well, all of them, like you said, all of them, like, we all have fantastic memories of Lego. So, you know, I, you know, I, I, and we do, and my, and I was the same way, JB, I would, my mom would, or dad would give me like a bag of Legos. And yeah. Like, flea market or something like that and i would just i try to make stuff and it ended up half the time being just a wall but yeah. you know <laughs> you know it's something fun but yeah those new ones i so I, I i accidentally went into the toy toy aisle when i was going to the the sports section <laughs> section at target <laughs> it wasn't co- wasn't walmart but tar- at target and i was looking at some of those things and they're and they're fantastic they're, the, the mando stuff and the star wars stuff is really good it's why I really miss Toys R Us. Um, yeah. Because, like, the, the one we had near near where I lived, it was like 15 minutes away. It was mega store. It was like yeah. humongous. And the back wall of the entire shop was just Lego. And they had every possible shape, but they also had them built behind a little plexiglass screen. It's like, oh, I want to play with it. Yeah. And it's, it's probably a good job that the shop's gone because I'd never leave. Um, yeah. We've but, got yeah, a just, we've got a store in our business park where our the IT company that I work for is at, and it's just all Lego, and yeah. they they'll sell individual pieces or the the sets, or you can buy the minifigures separately, and you can buy swap and trade, and then there's also a mall that has one of those Lego stores in it, mm-hmm. and oh, uh, yeah. that's like like what Jensen's saying. They've got like glass cases in there of you know the the $500 millennium Falcon model or the, you know, the $700 at, at, you know, and you can, or a formula one car and you can see those all built up and on display in there, man, oh. you, you could get your credit card in a lot of trouble going <laughs> into that Lego store. Yeah. We have a Lego store here at, there's a mall outside of Denver called park Meadows and it has one of those Lego stores. It's one of the busiest stores in the mall. All oh hours. yeah. Oh, Not oh, even, yeah. It doesn't totally. matter if it's, you know, holiday season or the head dead heat of summer, the Lego store is always a popular place. God. And you thought hobby shops could do damage to your credit card. <laughs> like Scott said, no, <laughs> you walk out of there. It's worse than a student loan. That shit ain't ever. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. Did you, did you go while well, me and Jackson were about, did you go to Lego in London? Yeah. You chose poorly. So <laughs> you, not- <laughs> You and him went to bars, and then I'm like, you know what? I'm an adult now. I'm going to the Lego store. I know where I'd rather have been. I didn't have a choice. (laughs) So, yeah, the Lego store in London was amazing. Mm. And I I forget the exact location off the top of my head, but that store was one of the best I've been to. Rivals Times Square, obviously. They had a 20-foot Big Ben in there, one-to-one scale Aston Martin. They had a huge one-to-one scale kind of like Diagon Alley with all the – characters from Harry Potter and it was multi-level just just an unbelievable place not only it could keep me dry from the pouring down rain outside but uh (laughs) it was pretty awesome and certainly um you know I just find those places they're just they make you truly feel happy there's no other no other way to describe it if you walk into a lego store and you're unhappy oh boy um (laughs) I don't know. I just don't know. Like, I don't know what's going on. Um, Or a toy store in general, I shall say, because I know not everyone's in Lego, but uh, Lego is one of those universal toys that, you know, any any background gender um, can enjoy. You know, it's (laughs) it's something for everyone. And and if they make something that you don't like, friggin' tear it down and build it. Now, I do have one topic. It's controversial with Lego and uh, I cringe because I just reminded myself of it. One of my friends, his mom, and he accepted it. I believe they would glue their Legos together when they build the set. Oh Oh, yeah. No, I, uh, I have a friend. I have a friend whose wife gets all the Christmas village ones and she super glues everything together. Oh, yeah. that's criminal. I well, got she... called emergency services for Jensen. He's going into <laughs> cardiac arrest. <laughs> oh, they have probably... a Lego license revoked. <laughs> They're the same people that probably glue puzzles together or something. So, like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do hate to say this, but maybe I could accept the Christmas village thing mm. where you're going like if it's that's your thing. Mm. If you want to create a Christmas village put it up every year. I'm cool with that. But, you know, otherwise, uh, 
the creator in me and all of us are just having that like you know hair on the back of our neck stand up and by the way those christmas villages are freaking cool and we will probably start having those instead of like the porcelain ones at our house so i really want the they used to be called lego creator they're not anymore it's like lego ideas yeah uh, where it's like the the big city buildings and stuff and what i like is we're going on a bit now, I know. Uh, but oh, like, it's good. Just consumers can come up with ideas, submit them to Lego, and like, yeah, that's a cool idea. It got enough folks. We'll create the set for you. It's like, that's so cool. <laughs> I'm just not good enough at thinking. I'm not creative enough to even come up with a concept of a Lego set. Yeah. It's uh, it's so cool. I, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm just, I love it. You know, it's, it really brings me back to certain memories uh, you know, it, I remember getting home from school, you know, not doing my homework uh, and, and going into the basement and and going to the, the Lego town that I created. And it was it was cool because I could enjoy it with my brothers and sisters, too. You know, my brother's two years apart and my sister is six. Um, but that that didn't stop, you know, Legos from being a connection point between all of us. And certainly friends too. And I'm the kind of guy with the friends, like, don't touch my Legos. Don't get mine mixed up with yours. <laughs> mine are better. So <laughs> don't, don't, don't try to, don't try to steal the little, uh, you know, crystals uh, or, or the gold, the gold coins or, or the little treasure chest. Like those are mine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's uh, Legos, man. It's, it's unbelievable. I, I think I am going to buy this Rivendale set today. Yeah. So. I, I tell you what, I, I, I'll i admit it, you know, and it, I, I like the Lego movies, the shorts and stuff like yeah. that, too. The Star yeah. Wars ones are hilarious. You know, there's just fun. And, yeah. you know, it, it, it makes you want to build the things again. And it just it, it, it's just it, it, like everybody said, it, it just draws me back to that day. You know, those days back when you would get home from school, and, you know, yeah. and you would run into your room or downstairs or, and just start messing with your stuff, you know, and just playing around and having a good time. I, uh, the two sets I really want, and they're going to start getting hard to get soon is the office mm. and the friends apartments. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my, uh, my wife really wants, there's a BTS set. So the uh, K-pop, it like sold out in minutes and you can't find it. But like, like you said, these, it's interesting. Legos, some of the sets hold incredible value. Mm-hmm. Man, I can't wait to get mine and bring them back. I think I'll probably set up a Lego world in my basement. I'm, 30, <laughs> I'm, I'm 37 now and it's acceptable. So. Yeah, you're fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, me, I'm, I'm 26. It's just borderline not acceptable. It's like, you should be doing stuff with your life. This is really sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah that's great <laughs> well well jens thanks for indulging me in in lego talk i, no I certainly appreciated it and feel feel bad tj had to drop but you yeah. know our listeners if, if you've if you've gone this far in the episode <laughs> tell us your favorite lego set because we'll post ours too <laughs>